A very good morning to you, very welcome along to Tuesday Mornings OTB AM. We are what? Oh, two days away, really, today and tomorrow. Tomorrow, one day, 24 hours away from the start of May. You know what May means, Owen? It means m many things. Championship football, Owen. Championship football. That's I was thinking that was the answer. I was, That's I was, what it means. I was worried I was getting uh, obsessed with uh, Gaelic Games a little bit too soon there. All those phony wars are over. All the nonsense, all the, all the launches have happened, so the phony wars are actually officially... This is phony war season. The, mm. the Mayo-New York game is obviously officially the start of the championship, but no one takes that seriously except New York, right? Yeah, and then the serious business of the Leinster Football Championship and the Munster Football Championship begin. That's, that's where, where okay, the, okay, real, okay, okay. Okay. the real I, action I, I, begins. I, I, okay, okay. I get your point, but actually there will be, I mean, there will be, for everybody, apart from Kerry and Dublin, those games will matter a lot, <laughs> you know? I mean, we have to accept that. Like, if you're, if you're Kildare or Meath or uh, Carlo or Tip or, you know, th these are your All-Irelands. Getting well, to the Super 8 is your All-Ireland. The difference between getting knocked out in round two and round three of the football qualifiers is a big deal for those counties, I appreciate. Oh, it, must be, it must be great to be lording it over everybody the way you are right now. I'm not lording it over anybody. You don't care about anything I except except the aristocrats of the game. I just think it's important to imagine how excited we would be right now if the championship in its early stages, was any football good. especially, was any good. Okay, no, I get that, I get that, I get that. Well, we know that, right? Then we're not having a fixtures conversation straight off the bat. It's April. We have to wait at least until the middle of May to have that conversation, right? No? <laughs> give, give us two more weeks. Give us yeah, two or three droppings. Rory O'Carroll is back is the big news this morning. Yeah. That's why I'm excited. It's like, I'm, I, I legitimately feel like Dublin have challengers. It feels a little bit like um, the weight of the five in a row, the gap between Dublin's best players reaching the latter stages of their careers and their best young players just being not quite at their absolute peak yet. There's that middle tier. Um, uh, Ruby Walsh had a brilliant explanation for why uh, there was like a, a brilliant generation of Irish jockeys and then nothing and then a new generation of, of kids coming up. Basically, we squashed the next generation after us. We got all the good rides, we got all the good horses, and they left. It was like, that's how it works. I was like, God, oh, that makes a lot of sense. I, didn't, I hadn't really thought about that before. So you get this golden generation, and then nothing comes after them because there's no opportunity for them. So the dubs aren't festooned with that middle tier of players who are just in their absolute peak. There's a couple, I suppose. Um, but they're quite young. Well, no, no, the, but so there's, the, oh, there's the super young ones, right, who are coming through. The who are Harris. Exactly, and um, Conor Callaghan, who are still super young, right? It's the 25 to 28-year-olds. There's, well, there's a couple of those, right? Fenton, Kilkenny, McCaffrey, all come in there. John Small. Fenton, what age is Fenton? Uh, Fenton is 25 at this point, I'm pretty sure. Good point, he's 26. 26. Yeah. So they're, they're in that. Like, they have everything. It, it's probably... There's nobody in the 27 to 30 bracket, it's pretty, it, like, which would traditionally be seen as the peak. And then they've got plenty of 30-somethings who've been there. Right. I'm trying to talk myself so. into it. I'm trying to talk myself into it. I'm, uh, I'm getting there. And I, I, I'm happy that you are, because I, I'm trying to get excited as well. I'm, I, Peter I'm, Keane's having a few, a few shots as a five in a row. Uh, we'll talk about that in the papers, because yeah. they don't want to blow all our good lines here. No, don't. It's, uh, yeah, he, he's got some good lines. All the launches were yesterday, so there's just GEA content everywhere. And I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit excited as well. But uh, I'm also time to get giddy. It is time to get giddy. Come on. Come on. Okay, let, let's get giddy. The championship this weekend, London and New York playing host to two absolute barnstormers, I'm sure. To be fair, New York for the last two years has been, has been sensational. It's impossible to get a ticket over there this week well, if you're from Mayo well, or from New York. It's actually not. You can walk into some pubs and buy them for 100 quid, apparently. Oh, really? Apparently so, yeah. 30 quid face value. You can walk into a pub in New York and buy a ticket for 100 quid. $100? $100, yeah. Ah, that's only 80 euro. And what happens, to the, what happens to that money? Where's that money going? The in-between money? Uh, I don't know. It'd be interesting to find out, wouldn't it? Maybe they'll put uh, a special drink promotion on that night or something. <laughs> All you can eat and drink. <laughs> Two drinks. Two for Max. one Bud Lights all night <laughs> at uh, whatever Irish pub is run by a Mayo man. Um, no, I'm sure there's plenty of those. Uh, all right, if you want to get in touch this morning, you can uh, drop us a uh, text by using Twitter or hashtag OTBAM. Or we do actually have a WhatsApp number, which we can never remember because it's like a, just a random 083 number. So uh, we'll get that for you and we'll put it up on screen and we'll uh, tell you what that is. And then, you know, you should just put in your phone as those clowns and you can tweet those or text those clowns and WhatsApp us and then... Um, you know, we'll check that. We'll put everything up that arrives un unsolicited. We'll just put it straight up. That's a, a dangerous enough tactic. We should start a mega WhatsApp group where uh, everybody can see the abuse and uh, we can respond like uh, first hand to the abuse. That'd be ideal. Yeah. Would it? Not sure. <laughs> It'd be cathartic. I mean, it might be, or it could just ruin our, our souls. It would My soul's our already gone. Ah, well, you know, you've made a re quick recovery.
<laughs> not sure about that. I don't think you can get souls back. You can buy them back for an indulgence. Just, you're in the wrong shirt tone. Right, uh, here's what's coming up on the show this morning. Going to talk you through the sports pages in about uh, three minutes' time. In about a minute time. Going to talk Roy O'Carroll around about uh, ten past eight. It is the big GA news this morning. Dublin had a hole at fullback and they fixed it. Will Roy O'Carroll go straight back into the team? Probably not. Probably going to make him um, sit it out until the Super 8s and then they'll stick him straight back in the team for all the big games. Um, GAA versus GPA or GAA plus GPA. You make your own mind up around that uh, about uh, 20 past 8. Spurs against Ajax, the Champions League semi-final first leg is tonight. Uh, Barcelona Liverpool's tomorrow. Uh, bringing sports news a little bit later on with Phil Egan. Katie McCabe, um, who is the Ireland captain, won the league title for Arsenal uh, during the week. Um, she's won a cup, she's won a league title, she's signed a new deal with them, so things have gone really well for Katie McCade. Rob McInerney is going to join us in the studio around about five past nine, and we're going to talk more Champions League around about uh, 20 past nine. Punch Town also starts today, so we'll get a bit of Punch Town action for you uh, going a little bit later on as well. But now, let's uh, bring in the newspapers. So working our way through the headlines, going to start with Times Ireland edition. And the back page here is Spurs star injury blow for Ireland. This is a bit of a disaster for Ireland's under-17 hopes because Troy Parrott was stretched off while playing for Spurs under-23 last night. Um, had a fairly hefty challenge from one of the Derby County under-23 players and uh, we got our campaign away underway on Friday. It's in Ireland and we play Greece at Tala and then we got the Czech Republic on Monday and then we finish against Belgium on Thursday week. We need the top two finish in the group to secure a quarter-final place for the third successive year. So uh, Irish underage football is actually going quite well at the moment. And then semi-final is bigger for us than a trophy. Some really great details of the Maurizio Pochettini, Maurizio Pochettino Daniel Levy meeting uh, five years ago as it was now and what he needs to do. The Irish Times leads with uh, tonic for the troops as Ajax, boss, Ajax bosses go back to the glory days and Pochettino and Spurs reach for infinity and beyond. Mary Hannigan, meanwhile, has spoken to Louise Quinn. Good times rolling at last for Arsenal's Quinn. And then Emmett Malone talking about the Republic of Ireland under 17s to take a step What's into the What's the Pochettino unknown. headline? Uh, to infinity and beyond. Uh, let's do this now. Let's talk about Murcio Pochettino's quotes. Buzz Lightyear music there. Very uh, timely. Just a complete coincidence. We absolutely did not uh, plan that. So uh, Pochettino talking uh, about the next couple of weeks for Spurs, obviously a big few weeks, particularly in the Champions League. Not in the history of football can another story like Tottenham's be repeated. You need to settle your dreams in the infinity and beyond. I'm already living my dream, said Pochettino. To be in the semi-final with Spurs was a dream five years ago and we are living the dream. But you must always dream with the moon if you want to get to the sky. What a great line. When you are ambitious and you want to achieve big things, you need to set your dream. I was always a dreamer. When I was very young, I dreamed in my hometown of Murphy that one day I would be a football player, and I achieved that. It was tough to achieve all that I dreamed, but I always believed there was some energy, the power in your mind, and when you are determined to achieve the things that you dream, it's only about waiting and working hard to try to get them. Heartwarming stuff from Maurizio Pochettino. Oh, yeah. There's great stuff, there's great other stuff in the press conference as well, which we'll get to in just a moment. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Poch is buzzing, as you just heard there. Mauricio sets sights on infinity and beyond is the back page headline on the star. Fanning blasts camp ban. So, uh, Waterford boss Park Fanning has labelled the GA's proposal to ban warm weather foreign training camps a load of nonsense. Fanning side enjoyed a recent camp in Portugal approved by Croke Park Chiefs. Tribute says another Lisbon Lion is lost and uh, PSG's 100 million bait for De Gea. Paris Saint-Germain will offer David De Gea a package worth in excess of 100 million euro to lure him from Manchester United this summer. I mean, if you're getting offered 100 million quid and it's like, will I go and live in Paris? What's the difference with Paris, Manchester? I mean... With double the money. You know, I'm going to go. The Irish Examiner goes with Wall of Fame. Myler confident Pork will be ready for Munster Hurling Championship and daring to dream Pochettino urges Spurs to see his Champions League destiny. Mike Quirk then is writing this morning about the April Club Month. How was your April Club Month experience? It was very good for Quirk himself. Uh, League of Ireland, Cork City helped by Harps. Rovers stay ahead of the pack, while Munster coaching recruits will have attacking focus. Meanwhile, Ruby Walsh writing this morning that classical dream can cap great season with Punchestown win. The... Um front of the Irish Daily Mirror this morning. Luis Suarez, Liverpool have a bright future after I helped dump them out of Europe. And he's got his um, salute uh, to infinity and beyond. Spurs Lightyear in Euro rallying call. And they've mocked him up as Buzz Lightyear. And then PSG plot £90 million pounds to Haya raid. Uh, so this one is, Paris Saint-Germain will offer David De Gea a package worth more than £90 million pounds to lure him away from Manchester United. £90 million, pounds, 100 million euro. And Troy stick as a parrot. 
See what, see what they did there? See what, see what they did? Do you want to explain it? No, I get it. The back page of the sun is Joy Story. Buzzing Poch tells Spurs to aim for infinity and beyond. While Ole Crock Shock, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's slim top four hopes have been rocked by an injury crisis to his strikers, namely Marcus Rashford and Romelu Lukaku. And he's sick as a parrot as well. So the sun and what was that, the mirror along similar lines. Boko was sick as, par- as a parrot and both go with a mock-up of Mirzio Pochettino as Bus Lightyear. All right. Uh, I, I didn't know where sick as a parrot actually originally came from. thought that maybe it had something to do with... Um uh, Your tone suggests it has a, a grim history. Well, it's it's like just not interesting at all. The phrase was originated by the dramatist Afra Ben in her 1682 comedy The False Count, in which the maid just synthesizes her mistress Julia. Lord, madam, you are as melancholy as a sick parrot. I thought it was to do with the dead parrot sketch from Monty Python, but it's actually way, it's a good bit older than that. I mean, 1682... The 70s, what's the difference? It's all in the past, right? It is. The, the past is Who the Who can past. tell? Who can tell? Once you're uh, old, you're old. We all live in a continuous present at the moment with an accelerated culture. So, O'Carroll, come back. Croaks, fullback, returns <laughs> to dub squad after four years. I mean, this, this might be some of that. Because I definitely thought that Mayo and Kerry had a chance if, if everything worked out a little bit. And, you know, there was a little bit of collateral damage, say. And who knows, maybe Tyrone as well. There's enough good teams that Dublin will have good game, good game, good game backed up in a way that they haven't had since they've had to play Mayo twice because they drew with them. Mm-hmm. This is the first year and then y- You think that um, Roy O'Carroll comes back that Kerry, Mayo and Tyrone should be in concert that the three managers should be meeting each other on a weekly basis trying to come up with some sort of plan to end the five in a row? Well, are you, are you saying it's not happening? Well, it, it's, it could I mean, be a very good idea. The, on what basis are you saying it's not happening? Where is your evidence of that? Well, my evidence for not Where's happening absolutely that? doesn't exist therefore it is definitely happening. Where's your evidence for that? Uh, the Irish Independent also have that O'Carroll story. It's Colin Keyes writing that he's about to make his Dublin return, uh, while Park Fanning has said that training camp bans are a load of nonsense and that the GEA have bigger fish to fry. But that's great news. That, um, that uh, St. George's Cross that Conor Murray is wearing there is not an England jersey. It's a do not tackle our <laughs> most important player jersey that Munster have. Yeah, very good news. He is expected to be fit to play Benetton this weekend in the Pro 14 quarter-final. Uh, meanwhile, Keen Tracy's got the headline that Van Grand seeks fresh input with new Munster attack coach. So the Irish Independent Ooh. understands that Munster have already opened discussions with potential candidates for an attacking role, for an attack role. Uh, currently doing the job, it seems that it's uh, Felix Jones doing it, but he's split between a bit of defence as well. Um, so he's been working as backs and attack coach, sorry, since 2017. So perhaps he could just focus on backs coach and then you'd have a separate attack coach. On top of that, Van Gran has also had a lot of input when it comes to the attack. So kind of like Leinster did a couple of years ago when they sought more expertise in areas where they perhaps were lacking. Remember they got Graham Henry in. People kind of forget oh, yeah. that short period of time where he anointed Joey Carby. There's your out half for the next 10 years. Munster. You forgot what province he was in. Munster. And, uh, you know, so, like, the obvious people that uh, everybody's going to talk about right now, the obvious person is Ronan Nogara, right? That's what people are going to jump to that conclusion. Um, but what about Paul O'Connell? Why not? Like, what, his role with Stade Francais was, I'm, I, I can't quite recall. I mean, it, it doesn't... It, it doesn't matter, though, does it? No, because, like, if you give him one thing to focus on, he's going to be hyper-competitive at it, we'll do all the work, we'll come up with good ideas, we'll be able to communicate it well to his players, we'll have the in- instant respect of everybody. Like, is he not a... also has a, like an opening at the moment for just such a job? Is, it, is that a potential? Just throw it out there, don't know anything. Irish Daily Mail, ban is a sham. It's good. Ban is a sham. It's fine, like, it's, a, it's no sick as a parrot. Data boss hit out at foreign trips rule and then to infinity and beyond buzzing Pochettino tells his Spurs players to reach for the stars. Now United want Rio as sporting director. Ah, uh, really? What? Mike Phelan, Rio? I mean, as the roulette wheel continues to go around with the Man United head instead of red or black, what's it going to land on? Roy Keane. Ah, uh, no. Arthur Alberston. No. Peter Schmeichel. Peter Schmeichel, maybe. No. Peter Schmeichel has a better no. chance than Roy Keane. No, they're all, they're all ridiculous. Rio Ferdinand's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. You need somebody who has scouted every single team, who knows all the scouts. You need someone who, like, understands exactly... Rio Ferdinand has met Manchester United Executive Vice Chairman Ed Woodward to discuss becoming the club's sporting director. Now, do you think Rio has that meeting 
and says, here, I want the job. And Ed goes, well, you're in the media, so I'm going to have to sit here and smile and listen and go, yeah, Rio, yeah, sure, you, you can leak this now. Make me look stupid again. Well, I suppose, what's the, what's the price of you not just having a go at me? Is this Rio Ferdinand news dependent on Solskjaer turning things back around once again? United's owners, the Glazer family, have been keen to get the former England defender on board since his retirement four years ago, with personal circumstances made that unworkable. Ferdinand did his best to undercut David Moyes. And um, now, it turned out he was right about Moyes. So maybe that was the right thing to do. Maybe the standards dropped so precipitously when Moyes arrived that it was incumbent upon the senior players like Ferdinand to go, this is the wrong guy. We, we are doing things wrong. This is not how you do things at a team that's going to win the championship or compete for the European Cup. So maybe he did know a lot about that. Um, and maybe you know you kind of have to reconsider how his United career ended at that point. Um, but I don't know. Um, United are restructuring and want someone to oversee transfer strategy and talks while being in tune with the manager. Ferdinand, given his United links and business experience. Uh, Woodward has identified Ferdinand, given his United links and business experience. Um, I don't know. Ferdinand's not the right character for this, yet. If he wants to be that person down the road, you've got to go and spend your time, or you've got to be your assistant to somebody who you're plugging in from the global game, who is absolutely immersed in... Uh, how transfers work, what the best contractual nuances are in the world of sport at the moment, um, in how the finances of the club are supposed to be run, and somebody who completely is on top of uh, what 14-year-old goalkeeper at Ajax is the best 14-year-old goalkeeper in the world. It's impossible to be completely on top of that. Like It's obviously huge teams that are running these scouting missions, but it, I guess there is a learned experience you can get about how to run a team like that or how to be a sporting director. Like, How do you become a successful sporting director? You'd imagine that a lot of it is learning on the job or, as you say, being assistant sporting director or seeing how somebody better than you does it. Like When you talk about some of the best sporting directors in the world, like it's, it's very tough to see how you actually get to that level without years and years of being involved in the business of football. And ultimately, has Rio Ferdinand been involved in the business of football? Maybe he has. Like I mean, he, you look at uh, his kind of presence on social media, for example, he's very careful of brand Ferdinand. He's uh, he kind of like had a, a fly on the wall sort of um, live action documentary about him made during the World Cup last year, just as part of his own brand. Like he does seem to have a lot of business now, but ultimately that's just not enough to become a sporting director. No, and it, it's all been business now, it's about an individual as opposed to about a, a team or a club. Here's his reaction on BT Sport immediately after Man United's dramatic last Champions, last gasp Champions League win against PSG. <laughs> but, but, listen, all he's got. To, Man United might not thank me, but get the contract out. Put it on the table, yeah. let him sign it, let him write whatever numbers he wants to put on there, given what he's done now since he's come in, and let him sign the contract and go. Ollie's at the wheel, man, he's doing it, he's doing his thing. Man United are back. That should have been the closing. I should have let you do it tonight. Well, you know, himself and Gary Neville that night, I think, disqualified themselves from being the sporting director of Manchester United. Uh, did you see the Gary Neville Ole Gunnar Solskjaer interview after that? Yes. Yeah. So, like, just you can't you're you're too emotionally invested in this you need to take a step back and be business people for this job for these roles well being invested i i can't imagine you can't be emotionally invested in manchester united if you want to be sporting director of manchester united that's you can't, okay you can't be making emotional decisions like write down whatever numbers you want on this contract david de gea or or Marcus Rashford or whoever who's just done this amazing thing. Go on, I'm going to negotiate with you right this second because that's the precise moment that we do business. There is still a little bit of room for emotion when it comes to the business of football. Is but there? Granted, a, granted is there, it's, it's is, a lot colder than it used to be. Yeah, well, who, who? Your manager can have emotion if that's what he's using as a as a tool and a spur. But like, Chiki Bagerstein can't be having emotion when it comes to deciding whether or not they're going to spend 50 million on Raheem Sterling or. 50 million on somebody else or try and sign Alexis Sanchez. Like, but when you have that conversation with Raheem Sterling or with Raheem Sterling's agent, granted, agents aren't the most emotional people in the world. So they're pretty uh, emotional. Uh, they're uh, like, uh, there's uh, general uh, joy at the money that they're stealing from you. Emotion is a useful tool in any negotiation, no? It's not, it's not as important as the bottom line, of course. But I'm not saying it's completely null and void. And I think that he cares about Manchester United and I don't think that should be used caring, to disqualify Caring him. about him should qualify, but saying you can write whatever numbers you want in the contract, facetiously or not, like, no thanks, I'll have um, somebody who's going to go, 
We're just going to wait a couple of days and see how you get on. Maybe we're just going to wait until the end of the season here, Ole. You know, who knows? Maybe you'll limp out of the Champions League in the next round against Barcelona and we'll see that actually you're not quite fully on top of this job just yet. Maybe, we'll just, maybe that's what we'll find out. And at the, in the summer, as Maurizio Pochettino celebrates his Champions League victory, we'll go, yeah, come on, come on, come on, Poch, come on. 20 million, who cares? It's, it's only, we've spent 800 million on shit players. Yes. Maybe that's the route to success for Manchester United. Make Rio Ferdinand sporting director now. Rio Ferdinand goes over to Pochettino's house and says, write whatever, write whatever you want down on that piece of paper and we'll pay you to become United manager. Uh, the Racing Post this morning. Mullins holds all the aces. Andeso, Min, Classical Dream and Get a Bird. Uh, champion trainer out for a roaring start with a whole host of stars. You could do a four-timer with those today and you'd get, um, you'd get decent odds. Get a Bird's at around 6 or 7 to 1, I think. At least it was on my check last night. Uh, a couple of the UK back pages then. The Guardian leads with England accused after Hales told World Cup dream is over. He's out of the World Cup plans after a drug ban. And to infinity and beyond, Pochettino focuses on Champions League glory for Tottenham with a little help from Buzz Lightyear. And it's also the headline on the front of the Daily Telegraph sports section. To infinity and beyond, they say Pochettino on living the dream at Spurs and channeling his inner Buzz Lightyear. Downs Darren O'Hagan leads the Irish News. Uh, O'Hagan would take Ulster final over Super 8. Well, you're just wrong. You're, we were just wrong. I'm sorry, but this is the whole nonsense of the Ulster Football Championship. The Super 8 is where it's at. Well, maybe, look, I, if you reach the final of the Ulster Championship, obviously you've got a fairly straightforward path to the Super 8. And it's not an either or, it's a false duality that somehow has become part of the conversation. But, like, really getting beaten in an Ulster final because that's likely what's going to happen to Down at the moment, versus getting to the Super 8s, getting a home game, seeing where you are, getting a game in Croke Park, having football all the way into whenever the Super 8s actually finish. Much better for a young group of players than uh, getting beaten in the Ulster Football Final. Yeah, like I'm not, I'm not sure if it's down the county to be having that sort of discussion with itself about whether they'd prefer to get to an Ulster Final or get to a Super 8. I think they'd be delighted to, to get to either, really. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tough championship and it's also a tough place to be existing in the back door. It's like, we can't actually categorically say whether or not it's going to be an easy path to get to the Super 8s from losing the Ulster final because it's a, an open draw in the back door where it's, it's all losers against all winners. Like, we, we just don't know who it could be up against them in, in, in the, the back door. So, uh, as you said, it's, I, I don't know, like, down making an Ulster final would be a very good achievement. Making the Super 8s would be better for the team. Yeah, definitely. Better for the team, better for the management, better for them to understand exactly how things go. Yeah, well, Min and Undeso are up against each other um, in the 5.30 today. Uh, so you couldn't have um, all of those four in. But a treble of Get a Bird, Classical Dream and Min is coming out about uh, 9 to 1. Are you saying that's a good bet? I just, I don't know. If John Duggan gives it the, the thumbs up, then uh, I'll go in on it. Get a Bird uh, has fairly staunch competition. Uh, it's got to be Delta Work and a Plutard. And I'm just not sure that's going to happen. So uh, where are we going on? Where are we going? Should we finish off with the Pochettino quotes before we get into some of the GEA? Yeah. Uh, just because I, I have them here in front of me. So it's not just the Buzz Lightyear stuff. There's also other good stuff in this press conference yesterday. Talking about getting the Spurs job, there was some interesting stuff on that, which we've touched on in the back pages. So Pochettino was speaking uh, about going to uh, Danny Levy's house. He was uh, without shoes, he said, dressed in pyjamas. But it was the afternoon, not the night. It's the truth. We talked first of all about the squad and how they showed me it was 34, 35 players. I said, it's an NFL squad. How are you going to handle that? The principal objective was to help the club build, to finish the training ground, to build a new stadium, to be competitive at the same time. We've done that, and after five years, you must congratulate everyone here. We still haven't won a trophy, but what we are doing now is more than just a trophy. So two things there. Is this, or is this not better than winning a trophy for Spurs? And second of all, Daniel Levy wears his pyjamas in the middle of the day while doing his negotiations. I mean, that's mad. Is that... A ploy. Is that, is that like, write whatever number you want on this blank no. piece of paper sort of business like ploying? No, that's like, uh, it, it, I don't know if you've ever seen any of those old, um, the old Sherlock Holmes where he's wearing his pyjamas in the day and puts a house coat on. And kind of, you know, it's like posh. It's ultra posh. Do you have a pipe as well? I mean, does Daniel Levy have a pipe just for show? Is he the type of man who might just have a pipe for show? Maybe. Well, if I was in his position of power, I would 100% have a pipe for show. You know, the, the pyjamas would be silk, right? Mm. Definitely. And There's no question about that. And like, the, you know, he's not wearing a cheap pair of 
penny slippers either. No, it's cashmere. There's a lot of cashmere and silk going on there. Yeah. Um, so that they're the two things that we take away from it. Like, talking about the NFL squad, it's kind of ironic that he uses that phrase, given the fitness issues that have hit the squad. Granted, it's the reason why Spurs seem to be such a tight-knit little community, is because they've got a, a thin enough squad. <laughs> no but, players. But uh, the reason why they might crash out against Ajax is because they have no players. And you talk about this idea of fitness and being under the cosh when it comes to the intense schedule in England. And uh, Pochettino has very vociferously in the past kind of spoken out about this, how and Pep as well, about how the English player, players in the English league uh, get flogged and is complaining once again about the fact that Ajax got the weekend off, which in fairness to the Eredivisie is like this amazing thing that they also did before the second leg against Real Madrid a couple of rounds ago. And um, the, their manager, Eric Ten Hag, has been out and he's kind of hit back at Pochettino. The beef is real, one could say. Uh, we play in the Eredivisie and we get 10 million euros from TV and Tottenham gets much more. Is that unfair for us? Those are the circumstances. You just have to deal with them. Which would you rather? Would you rather have a bottomless bit of cash or <laughs> yeah. fit players? Bottomless bit of cash. It's prob- probably a tad better. Um, so that, that, should, that adds a, a, like a, a little bit of a, a different edge tonight. They've also like opened up training to their fans as well, something that we haven't seen from too many teams recently. Ajax. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of a, there's a big feel-good factor around this Ajax team at the moment. Of course, we saw Ajax play in the Champions League this year in Lisbon. I, wasn't, I didn't really like the Ajax fans. It was just a little air of tension as they rioted in the stadium. <laughs> We're tr- trying to do kind of a, a subtle character assessment of Ajax as they were throwing bottles and like, lighting flares. And, and ripping up seats. I mean, I, seats. I haven't seen seats being ripped up really since the 1990s, but they're doing a good job of it. I'm sure when uh, the kind of playing field levels out, when they're in Amsterdam, for example, that it's a, it's a much nicer crew. Um, that's pretty much like where the Pochettino quotes end. Uh, Van der Sar should be the former United player they should be going for. However, why would you ever want to leave Ajax? For money. Like, just that you just... you back up the Brinks Allied truck, you open it, and the money falls out, and it's in unmarked bills, and you go, there's one of these every week for you, Edwin, and your family, forever. And we're just going to... Screw my duck. Off you go. It's you th- can wear your jammies, we don't care. You can actually get paid by cash if you wish. We don't have to wire you the money, we can actually pay you by truckload of money. That is, that's, that's also a, a bit of an intriguing situation if you are IX Sporting Director because is that one of the most frustrating jobs yeah, in the sports be. home tour? Is it actually it one of the most exciting? Or also there's no pressure on you because if you have a year where this something like this happens, everybody goes, what a legend you are. And if nothing else happens, you're like, well, what can I do? The players haven't come through. It's just that's how it goes. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, like the, the idea of actually regenerating a team that potentially gets to a Champions League final. That's an exciting project in itself. Yeah, but uh, like... We all know what happens next, right? Yes. You've an eighteen. Monaco happens. You've an eighteen-month window. Maybe you get this, most of this team for next year, or, or the players who leave. It turns out you have replacements already for because you kind of had an idea that they were leaving, and we already know at least one of them, probably two of them, are going to be gone, and loads more in the summertime when it comes to when, whoever gets promoted into the Premier League from the Championship realizes that they can spend forty million on a player who next year will be worth eighty million if they buy him from Ajax and give him one season in the Premier League, mm. like. Uh, and Bernard says Kevin Moore is Manchester United football director. I mean, like, you know, of the people who've, whose names that we've gone from Schmeichel, Arthur Albiston, uh, Roy Keane, uh, Rio Ferdinand, Kevin Moore at least has been involved in the business of football for 20 years. Like, he was involved in an agency and knows the machinations of contracts and what players want. Like, I'm not suggesting for an instant that Kevin Moran is a, a candidate for that job, but like he would have way more qualification than most of the people who we've seen Man United go for. Mike Phelan. Is Kevin Moran a nice segue into the GEA stories this morning? Yes, perfect. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll come back to Rory O'Carroll in a moment because Paddy Christie is going to be on the line uh, to analyse his comeback or his inevitable comeback to the Dublin team. Just to recap on that, uh, he was due to join colleagues for a gym session last night, says Colin Keyes in the Irish Independent, and they're back on the pitch this week, so exciting times for Dublin and exciting times for the country, really. Um, but well, so I, I think it's exciting times for the country. We should we should have this conversation now. I think that like you want you want greatness to be achieved while you're watching sport, right? You want so taking all of Tiger Woods' personality out of what happened, you wanted him to win because this is something that's great, just for the for the pure sporting spectacle of it. Like you have now borne witness to the best golfer of all time and his fall and comeback in sporting terms mm-hmm. as a human being, just parking that momentarily. Uh, I would like to see the Dubs win five in a row because then you'll have seen the greatest football team of all time 
in their pomp. And that's why I think this year's championship has the potential to be the best football championship that we've had, maybe since Armagh, Kerry and Tyrone were all good at the same time, when there was three legitimate All-Ireland contenders. Okay, there's two different points there. The one about the, the great All-Ireland Championship and the one about people wanting Dublin to succeed. The reason why the Tiger story is so special is because of the fall and because of the comeback. The lack of mortality about this Dublin team is what makes a lot of us want them to lose. And that's not because we hate them or anything. It's just because mortality is a very attractive attribute to any human being, to any sporting organisation. Well, no, we all <laughs> want to be immortal. What do you mean? Uh, so... We want to see the fall of this empire as much as we admire them and as much as we uh, admire them as, as uh, athletes and all that sort of thing. We want to see this empire come crashing down because that is entertaining. Drama is more entertaining than greatness. Uh, and the most dramatic thing that could happen is for Dublin to not win this year's All-Ireland. No, they, no. Have to, they have to get five and then someone has to stop them. That's not as fun. It's not as fun. The, it, it, nowhere near as fun. Like, the, the uh, snatching that from just the jaws of Dublin. Like, a comeback in the All-Ireland Final would make it even more special. If Dublin were up by five or six points and Lee, Lee Keegan charges through and bangs in two goals and Killian O'Connor has uh, you a ball, ball on the sideline, I'll be, be absolutely got it. But <laughs> uh, on, a, on a singular level, seeing Dublin lose in that manner would be funny. It would be... It wouldn't be funny. It'd be... It kind of would be funny. No. But it'd be dramatic and it would be but historic and it would just make what was a great team have actually another kind of layer to their veneer. We knew last year that Dublin were going to win the All-Ireland at this time. We knew it, right? We knew that they were going no, to catch we knew, we knew that in, in July. Don't, no, no, no. Don't, no, no, don't no. dramatize we, it. Started, it started, I, I didn't think know you, at the I think, I think you can look back to... I think you can look back to this show this time last year when we were going. There's not a hope. This, this football championship is going to be the most boring one that we've seen because it's, there is no... There is no jeopardy, there is no drama, whereas this year it's completely different. I think that, like, I think that Kerry could be absolutely sensational. I think Tyrone are going to be way better. I think that some of the other chasing, the, the second tier of teams, which is like Donegal and Monaghan, could actually put up good games against anybody in the Super 8, particularly in their home game. And uh, if they'd managed to not screw up Congress and Dublin had to play two games outside of Croke Park, I would be feeling like there's a reasonable chance that we're going to see Dublin in tight games four times this year, maybe five. Well, my take on last year's Summer Championship is that it wasn't as bad as people like to make out. That, and this is why I agree with you that this could be one of the great football championship, uh, championships because the Super 8s last year were automatically compared to the new formats in hurling. So you're comparing two of the great, especially one of the great all-time provincial championships, which is the Munster Hurling League last year, with the Super 8s, which, without Mayo with an under-firing Kerry, with a bad uh, day for conditions on the, the, the first Sunday in Crow Park, it didn't get off to the, to the best footing. I think that game in Omagh between Tyrone and Dublin was uh, a lot better than people made out. It was I, mean, good. I think the Galway against it, Kildare game was an outstanding game it, in Newbridge. Uh, I think Obviously, you had Clonus between Monaghan and Kerry. You had some of the best football last year played in the Super 8s. So the Super 8s is ripe for picking if you get all the good teams playing good football at once. And as you say, you're going to have Mayo back in there this year. You should do. You'll have a better Kerry. You'll have a far better Tyrone team, which is kind of ironic given they made the All-Ireland last year, plus potentially a resurgent Donegal. Like, could Paddy McBeardy play for the full Super 8s this year instead of getting injured in the first one? That would make it better as well. Monaghan could take a step up this year. It's exciting times. There's no question about it. And I agree with you. I think we are on course. I'm not sure about the, the timing. I'm not sure if this is going to be the year, but I do think we're maybe one or two years away from the football championship coming back to a situation where we're in August thinking to ourselves, what the hell is going to happen? There's still a, a sense of inevitability about, I don't know, a, I, about I, the I, dubs. I don't have that inevitability just yet. I mean, I think they need to... to they're not probably not going to get Jeremy Connolly back at this point. It's, um, is it too much to hope that they could have O'Carroll and Connolly playing? That would be an amazing, amazing story. Uh, this year, and I think that uh, I think they might end up needing Dermot Connolly yet. I think it's that close. It's way closer now than it has been at any point since the last time, since Mayo, well, two years ago. It's not a long time ago. Like, it, feels, it feels like, but there was nobody else. It was Mayo and nobody else at yeah. that stage. Yeah, it's true, it's true. And even then, that Mayo performance came a little bit out of nowhere, so. Peter Keane's been talking about this this morning. He's uh, in the Irish Times, uh, Ian O'Reardon's piece. Keane sees history bearing down on Dublin. 
So, uh, mind games? Yes. Can we use that phrase? Good man. Obviously it's history, said Keane. I remember as a youngster being up in Croke Park in 1982 when it didn't happen for Kerry. And that was a huge thing at the time. You talk a lot to a lot of the Kerry players in the day and some of them will say maybe they just froze or things just didn't run their way on the day. And the closer it came, the more difficult it got. I can't speak for Dublin, but it is history in the making. If they are going to win five, it doesn't come around very often, but you don't get there into position by being a bad team. Then he goes on and says, you know, great team, etc., etc. But, you know, again, it is history. No different to kill Kenny in 2010. When they lost the five, I suppose, at the time, in 1982, I remember Mick O'Dwyer saying he felt there were 31 counties against Kerry. And you can probably see where people like to change. But they do like uh, a history of things, too, that a team were able to do that. So, I don't know, he's kind of pointing to what, what you suggest there, the teams do like greatness. But, really, it's 31 counties minus you against Dublin this year. History in the making. It always makes me think of uh, Crazy in Love. It's going to be the theme of the summer. It's making a comeback. Yeah, uh, well, yeah that's, your, that's your big prediction. That's the boldest prediction we've heard this morning. All right, that's your papers done. Right, as you may have heard and off the ball over the past month, we've been giving you the chance to go to the Rugby World Cup in Japan. We're not joking. You could be going to the Rugby World Cup in Japan to see Ireland against Scotland in Yokohama on the 22nd of September. This is an amazing once-in-a-lifetime brilliant prize. This morning, you can win one of our green tickets. What we're going to do is we're going to give out 100 green tickets. Those 100 people are going to come to a show. One of the people who are at the show that night will walk away with a trip of a lifetime to see Ireland play Scotland in the Rugby World Cup in Yokohama. Uh, that show is on the 9th of May. Uh, all the 100 green ticket winners will join us at the end of the night. As I said, one lucky winner will be heading to Japan. Across Tuesday's hashtag OTBAM, we're asking you three questions at different stages of the show, all to do with the same Rugby World Cup game. When you have all three answers, send them in to us. You must have all three answers before you can enter the competition. Question one, which Southern Hemisphere team finished top of Ireland's pool in the 2003 Rugby World Cup? So which Southern Hemisphere team finished top of Ireland's pool in the 2003 Rugby World Cup. It's 23 minutes past eight this morning. You're listening to Off The Ball AM. We're with you every morning. Just go to offtheball.com, hit the word listen live, and uh, we'll be your breakfast sports radio show. Or if you want to watch us, you can get us there as well. You can just hit the, uh, the watch button. Uh, it looks like a big play button. You know what you're doing. Um, we're talking about the return of Roy Carroll to the Dublin Fold next on OTB AM. First, here's Marie Crow on another returning star in the GA scene. And Shane O'Donnell is back in Clare after his stint in Harvard. He had the absolute opposite experience that I expected him to have because he went to Harvard and realised how much hurling meant to him. I thought he was going to go there and forget about hurling because he's being it so much in the spotlight and there's been so much pressure on him after uh, scoring 3-3 in the All Ireland final. But he, what was a surprise to me was also a surprise to him because he said himself he didn't expect that, that when he arrived in Harvard, he had two Irish friends and he said to them, don't mention hurling, I just want to go and be another normal researcher in a lab and not defined by the hurling career that I've had at home. And within a few months, he instinctively found himself going back to uh, pick up the hurley, to go out playing the game, to watching league games on um, streams, to listening to games on the radio. And that's not something that he would have done before because he is not a sports fan and he makes absolutely no apologies for that. As a kid, he never supported a team. He had no interest in football. The night that we met or the day that we met, um, Man United and Man City were playing that evening, didn't know it was on. Like, just... Wow. There is no, he has no love for sport outside of the game of hurling, which is fascinating because it's so rare with sports people that they, they he says like as soon as the intercounty season is over, as soon as he gets knocked out, that's it. Like there, he doesn't, he doesn't tune into other games, isn't interested in what hap, what what's happening. But being over there and being away from him made him realise that he's part of something really special, and it means so much more to him than he realised. Yeah, Shannon Donald, really interesting character. Also, a really interesting character is Roy O'Carroll, and we're talking about that now. I'm delighted to say we've got Paddy Christie on the line, of course, the former Dublin fullback and uh, the Sigerson manager for DCU. Paddy, as a, a noted Dublin fullback yourself, it had been long talked about that the only slight weakness in this current Dublin team was maybe under the high ball, and lo and behold, Roy O'Carroll suddenly back in the fold. Uh, he's the perfect solution to that minor problem that the Dubs had. Uh, yeah, no, it seems they've worked out well um, for, for Jim and the lads there. They, I mean, he, there was there was a few problems around that area, and I suppose he's got the, the pedigree there, and he's worn an awful lot, and he's played at a high level for a long time. I know he's been away for a while, but I think it's a, it's it's not a perfect solution for a fella to come back having not been involved for a while, but it's certainly 
Uh, I'd say a lot, a lot of counties would be more than happy for him to come back into their full back line, you know. Yeah, tell us a little bit, uh, what, what has his form been like in, in club football? I know you've seen him play recently. Yeah, well, I, I went, unfortunately, to see Ballymun playing Kilmer Coods uh, in Parnell there a few weeks ago, and uh, he was playing that night, and I suppose it became apparent very quickly that he hadn't fallen back very far in that game, unfortunately. <laughs> he was uh, a, a, a kicking the fella. Um, I, you know, he caused us a lot of trouble. Not in any major way uh, going forward, just the, the, the sort of the solid sort of ground he gave for Kilmacud on their full back line. He, he was just powerful under the high ball, and he was, he was very solid coming out with the ball, very powerful, strong. And it didn't look too far off where he was years ago. <laughs> so... I suppose you know may have done maybe, maybe the break has done him some good. I don't know. I know he's a different type of character. From I wouldn't know the chap, but I know from what I've heard about him, he's a different type of person. He's not a GA um, sort of um, complete uh, a GA mad uh, player. I think he sort of has other things in his life, and he sort of he takes it as where it is the game and doesn't get overly uh, serious about it. So I suppose in a way that's actually quite good for a fella playing full back in a big match in Crow Park because he wants somebody who's calm and collected, you know. Has the role of full back changed in the last couple of years since Roy O'Carroll's last appearance for Jim Gavin's side? Um, I think that the, the, the big change in the last 10 years is, is that the, no one is really full back anymore. That's the big change. And I don't think in the last few years that has changed. In the last 10 years you'll find that full backs are down in the full forward line on the, the other end of the pitch and you'll see fellas playing cornerback who are actually playing full back and they're moving around all over the place to go out in the half back line you can't you can't be a full back anymore as such you can't say right I'm just going to stand on the edge of the square because um, the tactics have come on so much and there's so much analysis teams will know what to do and where to pull you um, and where, where to where to leave you so I think the, the, the game has moved on and I don't think um, I think he can play either game, by the way. I think he, he, he seemed to be well able to move around the place in the defence for Kilmer Cole the other night uh, or a few weeks ago. And he can also contest the high ball and, and throw his weight around in there. So either way, I think he's an addition. Whatever way the game is played, he's an addition. And certainly a fellow with, with that sort of pedigree who has done it at the highest level. I mean, it's a huge addition for Jim. I think they were struggling a little bit in the last year um, as regards just that the senior panel there's not too much new blood coming in and no major injections and I suppose this is like new blood as such even though he's, he's from years ago um, I think it's, it's an injection of freshness you know Yeah because I was wondering about how, how does the, the panel take somebody like Roy O'Carroll coming back in but like you know you assume that maybe some people are a little bit their noses are put out of joint because they might end up losing some playing time later in the summer but the vast majority of people will appreciate that this makes the group stronger in training sessions and it's going to make the team better in big matches exactly well that's i mean that that really comes down to jim um and and the management and particularly the manager the, the sort of ethos that the, the the values that he has in, in in the panel and how people see themselves um, and and their role in 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 the team and and if people see themselves as part of a team and working towards the goal of winning an All Ireland, well then they'll, they'll 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 grudgingly accept it. Whereas you know if you don't have a good ethos in the team, if there's a, if there's if there's not a good set of core values there, you'll get people sort of looking over their shoulder saying, "Well, this fella's coming in out of nowhere. Where did he come from?" I, I get the feeling over the years that I don't think Dublin would have won what they've won without having that good atmosphere in the squad and that good set of core values. I think Jim has instilled that and the way he conducts himself and you know in interviews and the way he keeps everything low profile it doesn't get carried away but I think he doesn't it, it's not it's not about Jim and when you have a manager who's 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 not about ego, I think that sort of transfers into the squad and it percolates down and I think that makes a huge difference to the panel. I think fellas will accept this grudgingly because some fellas will end up losing out, I would imagine, but um, it's still it's, it's for the common goal, you know. I wonder, is it possible that they could play him as a role player as well, where there are teams that they expect to bombard them with a high ball into the full back line and there are other teams that they don't or aren't that worried about? You know, if they were to come up against Galway again, for example, you know, Damon Comer obviously did well, there, I mean, there was a couple of goals that they conceded in the league that were kind of fluky high balls into the full back line. The Roscommon one springs to mind. 
where a ball gets tipped and ends up being a dangerous ball into the full back line. I don't know if you select a team on the basis that Ross Common are the next time you play them going to bombard you, but um, you know if there are certain forwards that you think that he's going to be very good to man mark or to manage over the course of a game. Yeah, well, I suppose you could you could you could treat it like American football and have specialist roles for certain fellows to come in and out. Of course, they can make unlimited substitutions. They can't in GA, but but still. You could, there, there is certainly, um, if you were looking after a team and you were playing against a, a team with a certain style of play, maybe, you know, very sharp, nippy forwards, kicking in low ball, um, and then suddenly they change and threw a man on the edge of the square, which caused you trouble. It is great in your arsenal to have uh, somebody like that who could just come in off the bench and do a job um, and not get sort of panicked in, in, in a pressure situation in Crow Park. I think that's huge to have somebody like that. So, I mean, yeah, he, that might be the case. He might be used in that sort of a role where horses for courses certain days, but, I mean, certain days to be, to be used, other days not. But, I mean, it's a great position to be in regardless. I mean, I think any manager in the country would be happy with having somebody like that involved, you know. So let's assume that Roy O'Carroll comes back to his peak and he's fully fit for the entire summer. What would your starting full back line be? <laughs> Well, I'd probably have Rory full back. I don't know. After that, I, go, I couldn't be sure. Now, there's a lot of competition in there, and you have a lot of fellas who can move around. But uh, I, I'd imagine that he would be, if he's playing well and he's fit and he's up for it, I'd imagine that he'll be he'd be top of the queue there, full back. That's all I'd say. You could, you'd be better off ringing Jim and asking him what his full back line would be for the championship, I'd say. I mean, I, I'm amazed you didn't automatically put Philly in there, Paddy Christie. I'm just, <laughs> just wanna, you know. I, if I put in Philly straight away, people would be accusing me of being biased <laughs> the Bally Moon thing and all. And, uh, of course, Philly will be, uh, I'd say, up on, up, he'll be there around the place at some stage, I'm sure. And he was, he'd come back from injury there a while ago and uh, I think he took a bit of a break as well. So, uh, like, that's another fellow who, again, you may not use him all the time because the nature of the game might dictate other things. But it's good to have a fellow like that who has a bit of physicality and you can put him in. And that's what good management is. That's what, what, what Jim will be able to do. He'll be able to pick and choose in certain days, in certain situations. One if you the, have those options, it's, you, you, have a huge, you have a huge advantage over the opposition, you know? Well, I think that's exactly it, because um, Tommy here has just reminded us of the game in Kerry earlier in the year. James McCarthy had already kicked a few points in Tralee, and then Tommy Walsh goes in full forward. Jim Gavin ends up reshuffling and puts McCarthy back on Tommy Walsh. So, you know, you're damaging the midfield and your ability to kick points by having to move James McCarthy back, all of a sudden, if that happens, it's like, well, Roy O'Carroll can do that, and you can still have James McCarthy dominating the game from midfield. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> when you're playing the likes of Kerry, Mayo, uh, Tyrone, in those games, you'd imagine this year there's going to be very small margins, and losing somebody like James uh, going back into defence like that is, is, is certainly a, a negative step. So it, that's... That's it. The, the, the big problem, I think, um, the big concern, I suppose, will be how easy the tactic is for somebody to put a, just a lamp in a high ball on top of a big fella on the edge of the square. That's the problem. Like, you can have tactics and you can have fellas dropping back and like that, but realistically, if somebody hits a really quality ball in at the right angle with the right trajectory uh, to a big man who's sort of running in on the edge of the square there, with the, with the square ball rule gone now as such, where fellas can run in on top of the keeper... Um, it, it, it's sort of it's, it's worrying uh, and it's very hard to stop so you know you can try and stop it at the source and stop the ball coming in you can try and move fellas around but if you have somebody on the edge of the square who is comfortable under a high ball and it will break the ball away or will catch the ball um, that's just that just solves an awful lot of problems and it stops all the different moves you have to make and the domino effects that happen because of that you know They've got Roy O'Carroll back is there any prospect do you think that Jeremy Connolly might come back, or do you feel like they need Jeremy Connolly at this stage? Um, I, again, just coming back to the to the new blood thing, I, I suppose I don't see in the last while as much uh, of the conveyor belt coming through that we had over the years. I think that just um, it's not that you'd be worried that Dublin can't win in All Ireland. They certainly are capable of winning it and are, are justifiably favourites for it, but. Every year, um, you, you always saw somebody new coming on the horizon, and sometimes there was two or three people. And, and now, in the last while, um, bar maybe Darren Gavin midfield, um, you you don't see too much um, really pushing on. So 
I suppose having somebody coming in fresh um, w- w- will add things an awful lot. I think that's really important because this, the squad can just, they don't notice it, but they can get a little bit stale if you don't have um, sort of fresh blood or, or new challenges, you know. Yeah, so Connolly, Mark and O'Carroll in training would suddenly get everybody <laughs> going, whoa, this is a bit different. <laughs> Well, I think I think with I think with Connolly, like it, no one would question his class and like that. Uh, I mean, uh, like he'd be in addition to any any county team if he comes back, um, uh, and, and he wants to come back himself, and and Jim is happy with taking him back. That's obviously in addition to Dublin. Um, I think they can. I think if I was being honest about it, um, I'd be. I, I think Rory coming back and playing well is a, is a bigger addition. Um, I think we're, we have plenty of good forwards. You're looking at Carmel Costello there who hasn't really played much championship football over the years, and <clears throat> he's certainly, you know, I would feel that he could do it on any given day if he's given a chance in Crow Park, and I think there are options there. But I just, in the back line, I just I feel an awful lot better knowing that if, if Rory is back and going well, I think I'd feel better about it, you know. Paddy, good stuff. Thanks for joining us this morning. No problem. Talk to you. Paddy Christie giving us his thoughts there about uh, the return to the Dublin panel of Roy O'Carroll. It's a no-brainer. It is a no-brainer. It's different situation to the Dear McConley situation. Jim Gavin has been in this position before, granted with shorter stints away with the likes of Paul Mannion and Jack McCaffrey. It's not going to disrupt squad harmony. It's not going to come close to disrupting squad harmony because if you think that Roy O'Carroll gets automatically installed at fullback without proving himself in training, then you're a lunatic. No, but a few players will be pissed off at the fact that uh, he is going to be eventually installed at fullback. When you think about it, of course he's going to play the game against Tyrone. Of course he's going to play the game against, assuming he's fit and isn't suspended, he's going to play the game against Tyrone, he's going to play the game against Mayo, he's going to play the game against Kerry. What other games are there this year that are going to be that important to the Dubs? None. They're the only games that actually matter this year. What are the matchups in those situations? Like Tyrone, it's, it's Matty Donnelly, uh, and he's been speaking about his, loving his inside forward role in the papers this morning and how it's not going to change with the, the mark. That is the matchup I'm looking forward to seeing this summer, if it happens. Uh, Tommy Walsh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that'll be yeah, a good matchup. That'll be pretty good. Which... And, and it'll be interesting to see what Mayo do. You know? Yeah, that. Uh, do they put Killian O'Connor in there, or do they just go, all right, if that's what you're going to do, let's see how you deal with Aidan O'Shea. Let's just see how you deal with Aidan O'Shea. <laughs> no, that's uh, yeah. It, like that is actually a, a very the, the male one is actually the slippier one to pick. If you've got like something resembling a fundamental fullback, what if Mayo put Lee Keegan in full forward? Could happen because they've done crazier things, aka Aidan O'Shea at fullback. Well, that was that was a different regime. But like, what if Lee Keegan is the greatest forward of his generation, but he's been ruined? Not ruined. He's obviously football of the year, uh, and uh, you know. There's, generally regarded as one of the best footballers of his generation. But what if he's the best full forward we've never seen? I, or centre forward that we've never seen? Because the best thing about Lee Keegan is his running and his, and his athleticism. Yeah, but what and if his he raw the game? Speed. Yeah, get him breaking onto the ball inside the half-forward line. Yeah. Against the blanket defence, like, who's going to stop him? But like, I, I, can, <laughs> I, can see him as, I can see him as a midfielder or potentially a half-forward. I think full forward is just a step too far for Lee Keegan. I don't know, he's got, he's got the finishing ability. Oh, he definitely has a finishing ability. Like, but so does every other of the, the full forward line for Mayo. I mean, I think some Mayo fans would dispute that. Uh, all right, this week on OTBAM, we're giving away some great prizes for any cyclist or even anybody who wants to get into cycling. That's me and Owen, by the way. Uh, it's all to launch the new cycling website, welovecycling.ie. You can win a Skoda cycling jersey and cycling shorts, plus a hoodie, t-shirt, cap and water bottle for your bike. To enter, just tweet us or comment with your favourite place to cycle in Ireland. Send us some photos as well if uh, you want, and we can see what's good about it. Um, WheelofCycling.ie includes helpful tips for all cyclists, from buying bikes to nutritional advice and info on the best cycle routes in Ireland. So WheelofCycling.ie. Myself and Owen have both been guests of Skoda at the Tour de France in recent years. It was literally the best junket I've ever been on. Yeah, it's never going to be topped. You you, you got out the West, did you? No, I didn't. It was uh, it was in the Pyrenees, so it definitely wasn't up to us. Right. Um, yeah, it was it was insane. It was the, it, w- it was the best junket ever. Yeah, was, uh, and I'm sure people would be delighted to hear this conversation. You get to you get to be in the middle of the race in a car as the th- bikes are flying past you, and then on a helicopter watching it from overhead, and then you get sped away to the finish line. So you get to see the stage three times. It's, uh, it's remarkable. Yeah, it is pretty impressive. We love cycling.ie is the website. Uh, all right, it is 8.41 this morning. You're listening to Off The Ball AM. We're on offtheball.com for you every morning. You can uh, get us there and uh, you can also watch us live if that's your thing on your phone. Now, yesterday we had a special interview with nine-time Irish flat champion jockey Pat Smullen. He spoke to Joe Malloy about his battle with pat- pancreatic cancer. 
Like many people, Pat was dependent on blood donations during his treatment. You can find out how you can get involved to help people like Pat at giveblood.ie. You can watch the full thing back on YouTube or you can listen to the piece on offtheball.com forward slash podcast. Here's a short clip of Pat talking about getting out of hospital in time for Christmas. I had the surgery and the, the two surgeries and uh, eventually, thank God, I, I got out in time for come home for Christmas. And uh, What was that like? Oh, brilliant. I was like, you know, I must admit... Uh, as it was getting closer, I was like, I can't be in here for Christmas. I just, you know, I'd, and thankfully the last week I was starting to feel well and I was walking around the, the corridors in the, in the, in the ward and, yeah. and I, I, the funniest thing ever, I, I remarked to myself walking by, well, there's, there's a lot of sick people in here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'd hate to be one of them. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so you know, but then then I wanted. I, I need to get out of here. I need mm. to get out of here. And thankfully, I, you know, a week later, I was I was like, discharged and uh, and home for Christmas. And uh, you know, I, from the minute I got home, then everything just started to mm. to go go the right way. I suppose back in your own environment and started to thrive again. And uh, so that all went on until uh, after Christmas into the new year. I'd say Santa arriving on Christmas morning never felt so good. Never felt so good. It was just, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was just amazing, um, you know, to see the kids and yeah, that was that was special. I can imagine. I guess probably too almost too emotive to even think about or talk about because you just yeah, exactly. There you go. More of that Pat's Mullen goodness available for you on offtheball.com forward slash podcast and uh, check out giveblood.ie. Um, all right, uh, we want to play you this. Uh, there's no spoilers in this. Are there, are there any spoilers in this? If there, there are spoilers in this. Oh, uh, well, well, I mean, I just, I just think that, like, you want to be a special kind of asshole to ruin Game of Thrones for people who haven't seen it yet. Right? Don't you? Yeah. Yeah, Tommy wants us to play a clip of... There's a brilliant new show we've got called Off the Wall for Game of Thrones aficionados, but you need to have seen the most recent episode to watch it, right? Right. It is a post-show recap. Post-show recap? Yeah. I was just going to say something about the title of the show, but I, it, it, it would involve a spoiler. Have you seen, You're not watching it? No, but I have to say, The Office yesterday, it was an uncomfortable environment. Well, I did share like If you people. mentioned the word game... Like, you could be talking about a game of football, but if you said game, people were shouting, like, shut up! It was shut me, up. it was me, I was doing the shouting. Everyone. I was doing the shouting. And I, I felt justified. <laughs> I felt, uh, frankly, I felt justified. Frankly, Will came in and started blabbing about blah, 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 blah. And I was like, shut up, shut up! It was like... What constitutes a spoiler for you? Because for, for me, it's any comment about an episode. Or, like, if you said to me, that episode was so exciting, well, that's a spoiler to me. Will just announced that it was a, a, a comparison of two separate things that are well known in pop culture. Like, uh, Lord like, of the Rings? Like, exactly, it was like this and this, and I was like... Yeah, he was a bit loose. I mean, because in the end, what happens in both of those? What happens? Well, that's a, if, if we can't include this conversation, we're just going to end up giving spoilers to yeah, people okay, who so haven't no seen Lord of the Rings. Right, uh, yeah. Well, in, in the Lord of the Rings, the, you know, we're, still, we're still all here. The, humanity didn't die at the end of it. I, I haven't yet discovered a piece of fiction where humanity... Oh, Michel Wallabeck. See, this, this was supposed to become the piece where Atomized. that was going to happen. But. Yeah. Uh, are, we, are we going to do this? We've, we've given enough, enough of a warning. So Tommy wants us to play this clip. It's a clip from the latest episode of Off the Wall. If you haven't watched episode three of Game of Thrones, come back to us in 35 seconds. Like, we wanted to talk about the MVP of the battle here. We wanted to pick out who was the person who stood out the most. And I think the best way to do this is, what was our favourite kill in the battle? Like, most people's favourite kill will be Arya killing the Night King. Mm. Yeah. The Anna moment. The Anna moment. The the an I was yeah, full on yeah, up yeah. cheering, <laughs> like clapping. I was like, I was like, oh no, it's going to be another yeah. Oberon Martell. Yeah, like, yeah. It happened. It yeah. was horrific. Oh, oh no. It basically like, was. Yeah. But, uh, but, but uh, at least she, you know, she got, she got point, the final like, say. I was thinking, like, I'm, uh, I was getting a bit sick of, fed up of Leanna Moment. Like, she's, she's been, like, she was supposed to only be, like, fair play to the actors, because she was only supposed to be, like, a one scene character. Really? But she did such a great job in season six. Six, yeah. To, like, talking down Jon Snow and Sansa, and that they give her more, you know. And she's she, great, yeah, though. Yeah, and she's obviously had a huge part to play. But, like, even, like, in this season, when she's stepping up and kind of talking down to men, like she's from a minor minor house. Mm. We don't they don't have many soldiers, but she's given this prominence in the great hall to, to stand up and kind of speak to everybody. And then even when George like you got to go down to the crypts in episode two, and she's like, I'm going to stand here and fight. And I'm thinking, 
like you're a small little girl. What are you gonna like? What can you do? But fair play to she kind of commanded her, her, her yeah, a lot yeah. of the inside internal army, and then she has that great kill at she the had end. Great moment. Yeah, I was so sad when she was raised just again. A, yeah, I was no. like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just a little child like here when you when you're watching like and she's getting smashed. Yeah, it was, uh, that's yeah, my she was, yeah, Leanna was pretty amazing. My MVPs. I, I it's hard to split them because you got Theon. I was about to say Theon. Jorah, all the guys who died, like Jorah, like he saved Danny, you know. So Theon and Jorah were his MVPs. <laughs> Two wieners, really. I mean, Jorah, it was like a fever dream for Jorah dying at the feet of his queen. He couldn't, he couldn't, I mean, he's been dreaming of that moment, giving his life for his queen. She, she had to kiss him, though. That was like, just to, you know, make it all work. In his, in his fever dream, she kisses him at the end, and then he wakes up. Or maybe not, because life is pointless after that happens for him. That's that's life peaking. Well, I mean, he, you know. Phil, welcome back. <laughs> I had zoned out. I was like, no spoilers. I said, I will get to this in about two years. You probably, I mean, it's a long commitment. Yeah. But I'm not going to binge it. I'm going to enjoy it. Would you like to be in my position where you could do it all again? No, I do. No? No? I wouldn't really do it again, to be honest. There's, 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 uh, there's definitely a season and a half when they're being very faithful to the books that are gross. It's just, it's horrible, misogynistic crap. And um, then they, they get ahead of the books and they, they kind of rescue themselves from the, um, in, inside the brain of the creator. And uh, I was like, Phew, But with that comes worse narrative. Away. What? With, with that comes uh, kind of a tailing off on the narrative. Like the story isn't as good as it used to be. Uh, no, no. I mean, there was a pointlessness in ultimately to Everything. Okay. Well, look, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> they could rescue it. They could, there's still three episodes after the rescue. It. Anyway, you can rescue this uh, segment. Yeah. Of okay, well, we'll start with the Champions League. First semi final tonight, and Spurs haven't been in the semi final of the European Cup for 57 years. The host Dutch side Ajax, and no Hyung Min Son for Spurs due to suspension. Mauricio Pochettino, in the build up to this game, has borrowed a line from Buzz Lightyear when he said they need to settle their dreams in the infinity and beyond. But he's obviously very wary of Ajax, who have already dumped Real Madrid and Juventus out of this season's competition. You must show respect for the competition and you must show respect for the opponent because it's going to be tough. I think the, it's going to be so tough. Ajax is uh, fully deserved to be where uh, they are. And of course, it's going to be a very competitive game. Yeah, kicks off at 8 o'clock at White Hart Lane or the new White Hart Lane or the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, whatever you want to call it. White Hart Lane, right? Well, we named it Stadium X Stadium Face a couple of weeks ago, so hopefully they just go with that. Could do, yeah. Shamrock Rovers remain four points clear at the top of the SSE Electricity League Premier Division. Rovers had lost back-to-back -back games, but they beat St. Pat's 1-0 at Tallis Stadium last night thanks to a first-half goal from Ronan Finn. But Dundalk and Bohemian stayed in touch with impressive away wins. Champions Dundalk won 3-0 against Waterford at the RSC. Michael Duffy scored twice. Bowes came away from the Brandy well with a 2-0 win over Derry City. The goals coming from Danny Mandrew and Dinny Corcoran. Cork City are now eight games without a win. They had to settle for a one-all draw at home to bottom side Finn Harps. And Sligo Rovers beat ECD 2-0. The Ireland under-17s under are obviously in action this Friday against Greece in their opening game of the European Championships and it looks very unlikely Troy Parrott will be part of that squad. He was stretchered off in Tottenham's under-23s win over Derby last night and Colin O'Brien named his squad yesterday but he'd actually left the space for Parrott because they were in discussions with Spurs whether he'd be available for the tournament or not but I think now that he's injured... No chance. That, that seems to rule it out, but we haven't got confirmation of it just yet. Something you've just been talking about with Paddy Christie, Dublin's drive for five has been handed a major boost. Rory O'Carroll has returned to the panel after spending the last three years in New Zealand. The Chemical Crows defender hasn't played for the Dubs since he was part of the All-Ireland final win winning team against Kerry in 2015. Has been playing for Crokes in the recent championship games against Ballyon Kickhams and Nafina. Two games that Crokes won and Certainly, O'Carroll impressed. Uh, he, he started the. Are you game a Crokes man? I am indeed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very talented family, the the O'Carrolls. There's, there's Good at taking them. each other off. Yeah. I, unfortunately, somebody uh, in our line of work found that out the hard way. Fergus McFadden's been cited for an alleged headbutt during Leinster's Pro 14 clash with Ulster on Saturday. If he's found guilty, he's going to miss the Heineken Champions <laughs> Cup final against Saracens at St James's Park on the 11th of May. 
McFadden conceded a penalty when he clashed heads with uh, Sean Reedy. Referee George Clancy didn't give out any further punishment at the time, having reviewed the incident with the TMO. The hearing is tomorrow, so an anxious wait for Fergus McFadden. He could be facing a minimum six-week ban. It's day one of the Punchestown Racing Festival, the Grade 1 Boyle Sports Champion Chase is the main attraction. Min and Underso are set to go head to head. That one gets underway at half five. It's one of three grade ones on the opening day. The Willie Mullins trained Classical Dream is set to go off as favourite in the champion novice hurdle. Delta Work heads the market in the champion novice steeplechase. A Plutard is also in the field for that one. The first race gets underway at 20 to four. Quarterfinal action at the World Snooker Championship this morning at 10 o'clock. Kyron Wilson goes up against David Gilbert. Ali Carter takes on Gary Wilson. And the other quarterfinals get underway at half two. Probably the one to watch. Neil Robertson and John Higgins, two former champions. And then Judd Trump plays Stephen Maguire. And American Andy Ruiz Jr. is set to be named as Anthony Joshua's opponent for Joshua's US debut in New York on the 1st of June. Joshua was obviously meant to face Jarrell Miller at Madison Square Garden, but he failed numerous drug tests. And the ban he's been given, by the way, the WBA, one of the sanctioning bodies, has said, uh, yeah, we'll suspend you for six months, which, me and that backdates to March, so he could fight later in 2019. And there's obviously no benefit six months after the drugs have been. No, I mean, he'll be there, he'll, he'll have learnt his lesson. Yeah. And uh, something we talked about on Off the Brawl last week with Andy Lee, just about, like, the promoters have to take this, this as is they a, say, like, we can't give these lads a fight. This is a cautionary tale for everybody out there who's thinking of doing drugs. Take, do the drugs, take the six months, come back, ripped, like, yeah, the redemption Make all story. your money. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there's a good piece on offtheball.com that Simon has done about uh, Manny Pacquiao and Keith Thurman and the star-studded welterweight division. Looks like the Errol Spence and Terence Crawford fight that we really want to see could be a few years in the making. It's a bit mad to me that Manny Pacquiao is still relevant at this level. Yeah, he was good against Broner. You know, he, he's still a big name, so if Keith Thurman was to beat him, uh, even if Pacquiao wins, if Errol Spence wants to take on... Pacquiao or Terence Crawford, you know, that's a, it's a big win on your resume. What age is Pacquiao? He's age? 40. Is he, yeah? Yeah. He's still yeah. selling tickets. He is, yeah. And uh, I suppose people still watch 40, I mean... As long you know, as he doesn't fight Mayweather again. Even the conditioning him. these days, 40 is, uh, you know, it's, uh, plenty... Great on. engine on him, Jer. Yeah. Um, the, what, what was it that Russell, Russell Carroll said that everyone was like, ooh? He, so, Russell Carroll pretended to be Royal Carroll. And give out about something. Was it Bill O'Carroll? What? Bill is the other brother. Well, it was Bill There's... pretending to be Rory. Yeah. Oh, right. Bill, Bill, Tommy's saying Bill's the funny one. Sh shots fired at Rostar. Was it Bill? Yeah. I think ah, okay, so. okay. Well, you probably know more. But did he say something about Donegal? Or was there, it was, was something it... to do with the game because it was 2014, wasn't it? It yeah. was after the Donegal game. And it was obviously. Oh, he's watched it every day since. Yeah. Was that it? Something along the line yeah. of that, yeah. Um, and uh, I wondered. And then Rory left pretty soon afterwards. I wonder, was that why? Yeah, well, he had one more year, but uh, he's, okay. he's back now. Well, that ruins my story. Uh, all right, uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can um, drop us a comment on uh, hashtag OTBAM. Phil, the drive for five, right, as a Dubs fan, how concerned are you about the fact that we're all talking about it all the time from now and that the Kerry manager ratcheted up the pressure yesterday at the official launch he knew everybody would be hanging on his every word by saying, well, you know, Yetta, we were up there, Yetta in uh, 82, Yetta, and we didn't get it done, Yetta, they froze. Maybe they just froze. He went full Kevin Keegan, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. They were a minute, like they were, what, a minute away from winning the... <laughs> no, yeah, they didn't freeze at all. They played really well against the best team in the country, the other best team in the country. Yeah. I, do you know what? The way Jim Gavin has that Dublin panel set up, I don't think they'll worry about anything. And the, the poor Lee campaign... Again, I wouldn't really worry. It's like they didn't really embrace the real changes and they just thought, no, fair we'll, play. we'll revert back to the norm in the summer and we'll be waiting for you. And if people want to say and doubt the dubs, then I'm sure they'll love that. I'm just waiting for the next story. I, the back page is obviously Rory O'Carroll. I'm thinking, will it be next week, Dermot Connolly? I think you think it's a matter of uh, when, not if. I think you just wait until the start of the championship, don't you? So that really you don't need to embed him back in the team until the Super 8s. Possibly, yeah. He's keeping him on a leash, ready to go for the Super 8s. That's a good tactic. I think, I think mid-season... Hungry Dear McConnelly. Some mid-season Dear McConnelly is exactly what the summer will need. We'll be, we'll be sick of talking about Royal Carroll. Royal Carroll will be old news in, in two it. months' time. Especially when the sun is out and Dermo can rock up with his 
sleeveless jersey to show off his bulging his, biceps. His Leitrim jersey. Do you feel that they need him to win um, it? Do you know what? Last season I didn't think so, but I think this year they actually do. Yeah. That's why we want him back, otherwise it won't be the greatest championship of all time if they don't get him back. Because if you had him back, it would be every single narrative. All the best teams, Tyrone have found their style of play, Mayo have their best manager and all their best players available. They've got like peace and harmony in the camp. Kerry have the greatest crop of youngsters that any team has ever had. It's like, it's all set up, but we need Jeremy Connolly to make it like the perfect story. Yeah. Who doesn't want to see Connolly and Keegan again? Yeah, come on, it would be amazing. Owen doesn't. Owen's like, no. I don't, the, want this, the, the, I don't want this great thing to happen in the history of Irish sport because it'll annoy me. A Mayo Dublin final this year is just kind of like the worst possible outcome. All right. As you may have heard off the ball over the past month, we've been giving you the chance to go to the Rugby World Cup in Japan. It's an amazing trip to Ireland against Scotland in Yokohama on the 22nd of September. A brilliant prize this morning and win one of our green tickets. We have a special roadshow on the 9th of May where we have 100 green tickets. You have to win one to get there, otherwise you can't come because somebody in that room is going to Ireland against Scotland in Yokohama on the 22nd of September. Uh, across Tuesday's OTB AM, we're asking you three questions at different stages of the show, all to do with the same Rugby World Cup game. When you have all three answers, send them in to us. You must have all three answers before you can enter the competition. It's pretty simple. We asked you question one at 8.15. Here's question two. Who beat Ireland in the Rugby World Cup 2003 quarterfinal? The score was 43-21. It was another European team. Who beat Ireland in the Rugby World Cup 2003 quarterfinal? The final score was 43-21. Now, Stephen Elliott was with Nathan on commentary duties for Man City's 1-0 win in Burnley on Sunday afternoon. Here's Elliott talking about Sunderland's season in League One. Have a look. Just before we let you go, uh, I know you're a big fan of your former club, Sunderland, and you were up there yesterday watching, was it a one-all draw in the end against it, Portsmouth? Yeah. So could well be a playoff final between Portsmouth and Sunderland. You've seen a lot of them. I know you're always commenting online about where Sunderland are, and everyone seems to have a bit more interest in Sunderland yeah. ever since the Netflix yeah. documentary. What's your sense of where the club is at the moment? The, the club, if you compare it, they've, they've had the double relegation, obviously being relegated from the Premier League and then, uh, then relegated again the following season from the Championship. They're in League One. If you look at the club now compared to where they were at the end of last season, the club was in turmoil. The ownership, there was there was like lots of kind of bad noises being made. The supporters weren't happy. There was like 20, 21,000 going to the game and it felt like you were going to a funeral. Whereas this season, albeit they haven't managed to get up automatically, you look at yesterday, there was nearly 42,000 at the game, which is unbelievable in the tour mm. tier. And they're in a good place. Like Obviously, you'd like to see a little bit more quality on the pitch and a little bit more consistency to kind of get the automatic place. But now, like you mentioned, they're in the playoffs now and anything can happen in the playoffs but it could, it could well be Portsmouth v Sunderland again in the playoffs and there's a little bit of a rivalry developing there yeah. now obviously with the Checker Trade final there a few weeks back and obviously yesterday was a little bit of a hostile game Aidan McGeady's been a bit of a shining light as well playing League One football which I'm sure isn't where he would want to be in his career do you think there's enough about him at the moment that he should be involved in the Ireland setup? I, th I think I, I watched Aidan quite closely this year, and he, I know people say he's in League One, but he, he stood out like a kind of beacon in that league. He's, nobody can get near him, and even there, the last few weeks, he's been playing with a broken metatarsal, which I'm not too sure if everybody's aware of. But now that he can get up automatically, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he has a little rest over the next few weeks and ho hopefully get himself right for the for the playoffs. But no, yeah, I, I don't see why he shouldn't be in the Ireland squad to answer your question. He's he's got something a little bit different. Like he can change the game I know people say he's had his chance with the national team but he is only I think he's only 21 or 22 yeah. so for me he's, he's a viable option to have from the bench if there's a tight game he can come on and do a little bit of magic as we've seen the, on the odd occasion in an Irish uh, jersey yeah you want to see McGeady back probably not yeah, probably a stretch isn't it the McGeady year is over for Ireland I think it probably is like it's uh, it's like the comeback on Vogue now since Glen Whelan yeah, I mean, look. If you need him, maybe we do need him. I'm not sure. I'm not sure we do. To be honest, I'd like, what's um, like? Okay, it could become a situation where the form starts to pick up at uh, a very late stage, and like you then automatically have to pick him based on that. Because ultimately, when it comes to the Ireland team now, championship form is just as important as any other form at this point, given it makes up the vast majority of our squad. So, McGeady in the championship playing well next season. Yeah, look, let's, let's wait and see. I suppose he can uh, come back and help with our uh, Euros campaign in Dublin when we're, you know, playing somebody good in the Euros in Dublin. Um, 
Isil Cody on Twitter says, I recently explained the complexities and intricacies of Yeraism to an Englishman, and after a detailed summary of the deep psychology behind it, he went, so basically whatever starts with Yera means the opposite is what they believe. It's just negging. Yeah, well, like, I'm not exactly sure have I ever heard a phrase start with the term Yera, except from you or people who <laughs> take the piss out of Kerry people. I'm not taking this out of Kerry people. Like, I've never once just started you. a phrase, a, a, any you. sentence with the word Yera. I love Kerry people. Uh, Paddy Christie, uh, sorry, then, yeah, so we were asking a little bit earlier on, as, as sports fans we want to witness greatness in our time, That's what I, that was my point about the Dubs, we want to see them getting into an All-Ireland final with all their best players there. Uh, Mick Foley's been in touch to say, I doubt if neutrals care right now about Dublin five in a row. A lot will depend on the final pairing. If it's Mayo-Dublin, who will the neutral root for? They root for Mayo in that instance. If it's dublin Kerry, I don't know who the neutral is. Do the neutrals ever root for Kerry? Probably not. I'm not sure if the neutrals all root for Mayo either. I think if it's Mayo, it becomes a situation where it's like 25 v 7. The 7 being Galway, Galway Kerry, Kerry, Dublin. Everybody else in Connacht, really. Um, I don't know. Ross Common and Leach are rowing behind them. I think the likes of Tyrone, like to the, after, say, Mayo beating them a couple of times in the last decade, I'd say Tyrone would like to see the, the curse last for a little while longer. If it's Dublin, Tyrone? It's, I think that's close to a 31-1. Everybody in favour of Tyrone? Yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> because of the... Kerry would like Tyrone to win in All-Ireland, would you? Instead of the five in a row, yes. Right. But like, there's, nothing to be, there's no insecurity around Tyrone, really. There's a bit of insecurity around the Dubs. If they manage to, to win the five in a row, then... I mean, Tyrone, obviously, were the team of the decade. When yeah, the second, best best team. Team the decade, <laughs> second best team of the decade. <laughs> Sorry, your second, def- uh, second ever best team wasn't even the team of the decade. Um, that's a rock and a hard place for lots of people, says Mick Foley. In, indeed it is. Uh, although a lot of people have been weighing in afterwards saying, no, anybody but Dublin. Yeah, no, I, 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 don't think, I don't think it is a rock and a hard. I think it's, I'd say that's 12-20. And uh, the 20 counties favouring Kerry, 12 favouring Dublin at that point. All right, let's move on, because uh, it's been a big week for the Arsenal women's football team. Uh, a couple of key players there from Ireland for them, uh, one of whom is Katie McCabe. Katie, good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning. How are you? Yeah, look, congratulations. You've had a pretty amazing week. And um, I, you, you've won the, the title with a week to spare, which is great because it means you get to properly relax and celebrate. And the celebrations can actually be much longer than they would be if you just won it in the last game. So at what point were you kind of confident that this, this was actually going to happen? Um, no, it was, it was a, a fantastic weekend. Obviously, it was a, it was a tight title race. And to do a game to spare was always nice. So you can... Um, yeah, we can have that that big game against Man City. Um, well, I don't think there was ever an initial game. I think obviously the Birmingham game was uh, quite significant for us because that determined we were back in Champions League, and that was what our, our main aim was uh, was for the season. So maybe you could say the Birmingham game because we got back into Champions League. And um, but I think obviously the whole day on Sunday was was fantastic in itself, and to finish it off the way we did was uh, was pretty special. You mentioned their big game against Man City. So Man City also unbeaten uh, over the course of the season and you've actually beaten them in the league. So it's been a proper title race the whole way through. Yeah, no, definitely. They've been, uh, yeah, they've, they've not lost the game, I don't think. Um, we have beaten them, they, they beat us in the um, up, in, up in Man City. Um, they've obviously a big cup final now on Saturday against West Ham, which are Leanne Kieran and they'll be playing in as well. Um but now they'll be looking to finish their season on a high. Hopefully, they'll definitely be looking to to win the double cup and uh, and go season unbeaten. So it'll be our job to to stop that uh, stop that happening uh, next week. Uh, Jordan Nobbs has been writing in the Daily Telegraph this morning, Katie, talking about Joe Montemuro and the role he's had as manager. And I know for you personally, he's had a big role in your career in terms of your graph. Yeah, no, definitely. Joe's come in and um, and done a fantastic job with us creating a style of play that suits the players and, and getting uh, getting us working hard the last two years to do that. But for me, obviously, to come in, I was on loan from Glasgow or from Glasgow City when I came back. Um, he was there, so it was, uh, was totally new, totally new manager, and he gave me that, that second chance um, to try to take my claim. And he's, uh, to be fair, he's one of the best managers I've played for, so uh, I'm really looking playing under him. 
What was the main difference between him and the previous manager in the sense that not only did he not have to go out on loan under the new regime, you became an integral part of this team? I think it was timing, if I'm honest. When I first came over, I was obviously quite young. And when Pedro signed me, and I don't think I was quite ready yet. I still had to, to work to get up to that physical uh, to physical battle to play at the top professional level. And I don't think I was quite ready yet. So for me to go out and get game time was really important for my development as a player. And when I came back, as, like, as I said, Pedro was gone and Joe was there. And maybe I was a bit more ready for for coming back in and trying to, to take my claim in the team and uh, Joe believes in me from, from the from the start so uh, it turned out alright So you were 20 were you 19 when you went over first? Nine, yeah 19 And then how long were you in Glasgow for? I was I was at Arsenal for a year and a half and then I left uh, for six months and then came back um, so yeah I was only in six Glasgow for six months, sorry. And when, when you when you get told you're going out on loan, are you like, okay, that's grand, this is this is all fine, <laughs> that's normal, or are you like, ah, here, no way, I don't want to go? No, to be fair, it was quite a, kind of a mutual thing, I guess. Um, I wanted to play, um, I was getting frustrated not playing, um, but I knew there was, that I wasn't ready, that I needed that game time, and the way the season was shaping up, it, like, the manager didn't have that game time for me, so... I wanted to go out. I just wanted to play. I wanted to, to, to fall back in and love the football. Um, and I did that at Glasgow City. Played some Champions League matches up there and they were really good to me um, and definitely helped my, my development as a footballer. And in terms of your own kind of uh, position in the team, because you, you played mostly midfield but a, a good bit at fullback as well this year. So that flexibility is always important when managers are looking at a squad. But as a player, I suppose you want to have a specific position that you're the best at, that you get to become comfortable and familiar in. Was that all part of getting out and getting on loan and getting those games as well? Yeah, I guess uh, I don't mind the challenge of having to play a different position. But as you said, you want to be focusing on that one position, which I like is... I like Beth's is a left or a right wing that kind of towards the end of the season me and Beth Mead have kind of been, been playing and obviously having Viv up top then and that would be our, our sole front three but we've not been blessed with injuries um, since the start of the season so I think the manager just needed me to do a job whether it be left back midfield wherever it may be and uh, I was more than happy to do it because it's, it's for the team uh, we needed it at the time and I'd do it again if we had to if it meant <laughs> we won a league at the end of it. Because you signed a new contract um, not that long ago, I think. Is it, is it in the last six months? You know, it was in the last uh, month or two, yeah. Right, okay, um, it's that recent, yeah. Yeah, no, so I was, I was really happy with that. Um, Joe, again, believing in me um, and no, I, was, I jumped at the opportunity. I didn't think of anything else and Arsenal Football Club was a fantastic football club um, so yeah, I was, I was delighted to, to sign the deadline. When you were 12 and 14 and 16, did you think that it was going to be a possibility that at 23 you'd be a full-time professional footballer? I I always it was always a dream of mine. I never knew if it was possible or not. Um, but I used to watch Emma Bourne and like Yvonne Tracy and Kieran Grant. And, like they were all playing on the TV for us. So I used to watch FA Cup finals and stuff, and I was like, I want I want a piece of that. Um, so obviously, I, you had to knuckle down and. Uh, Luckily, I, I played with Ireland at all uh, underage levels, and I think when you're in the, the system at Ireland, like it, you really put yourself on a on a, on a stage when you're play, when you're playing big European teams and stuff. And um, I just tried to give myself every opportunity, and I think working hard is very cliche, but it's a must um, when you want to to play at the top. Also as well, like you mentioned, the Champions League a couple of moments ago there. I think at the start of the season, that was just your aim, finishing the top two, to be back there as the club, the only English club to have ever won the Women's Champions League in 2007 with Arsenal. You must, part of you, despite all the celebrations, must be thinking ahead to next season and going back into Europe like that. Yeah, no, definitely. I think it's, it's, um, it's going to be great for the club to get back into the Champions League. I think yesterday, I seen on Twitter that it was 12 years ago to the day that Arsenal first lifted the... Uh, the Champions League trophy, which is fantastic. Um, but that's where this club wants to be and that's where hopefully we will stay in the next, next few years. It's not going to be easy, but um, I'm looking to get, I'm looking forward to getting back into it and playing uh, playing some top European countries, or countries teams. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be great. Katie, the other thing um, that the Irish women's football team 
it seems like they're a very tight knit boot uh, group. They had to come through. We all know the the struggles to get the the proper treatment that they eventually managed to wrestle from the FAI. That's the type of thing that marks you guys out as leaders and um, and certainly as role models. And sometimes sports people are a little bit uncomfortable with the whole notion of being. Uh, role model because it's kind of thrust upon you you know it's not something you volunteered for it wasn't something you dreamed of being when you're 14 wanting to play uh, and emulate Emma Burney you didn't think oh yeah I'm going to grow up and be a role model but it just is something that <laughs> you guys have to do now when you're you know captain in Ireland and, and playing for Arsenal and winning league titles is that something that you actually kind of enjoy and really fully understand that you do have power to inspire the next generation yeah no definitely I I, uh, I love her I was one of those kids that looked up to, to all the players aspiring to be them so to have um, young players <laughs> looking up to me um, wanting to, to play for Arsenal and play for Ireland is it's pretty special and um, I guess when you're just in, uh, enjoying yourself like that's, that's the main thing to show young girls next generation that you can do and you can do it with a smile on your face and I get it's, it's very rewarding like my sister is 11 um and she's 11 and she's playing like for Kilimanjaro as a local team and she's absolutely loving it and she kind of has them bragging rights of yeah my sister's the captain and she plays for for Arsenal so she's absolutely loving that but um, she wants to be a footballer that's what, like I had a conversation with her only last week and that's what she wants to do and to be able for her to be able to say that and, and have uh, and actually be able to, to maybe do it one day is uh, is pretty special. Yeah, and you're part of the generation that made that a reality. So congratulations, Katie. Best of luck. Thanks a million for Thank talking to us. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. It's uh, Katie McCabe there reacting after uh, Arsenal have won the league title this weekend. Um, directly involved in scoring or the creation of 20 goals this season. So not bad for somebody who ended up playing some games at fullback as well. Including assist of the season as well. Let's not forget. What was it? Back in January, the big long ball down the, the left flank, which took about a million players out of the picture. Uh, I dare say it's assisted a season, but uh, I haven't seen too many better. Louise Quinn is going to join uh, Joe on the radio a little bit later on this evening from 7 o'clock on Off the Ball as well. Now, uh, we're going to speak with Rob McInerney in just a minute, but first on last night's football show, Pat and Evan discussed the scale of the challenge Manchester United faced to get back into title contention. And looking what's happened this season and looking at the, the group of players there and the way they've been playing recently, and this inability to go and fight and battle and chase and be baller to put 100% in uh, every single week it's, it just shows that there's not a spirit there and also the leadership, now I'm not blaming Lily Gunnar Solskjaer for this because you need leadership within the group as well within the, the playing group it's one of the most common things, it doesn't matter what your sport is, it could be it could be rugby, it could be NFL it could be you know football, you name it see the guy who's the most important character, often the captain but not always the captain See if he's the kind of influence that's not getting you all together and getting you to work with the right spirit. You've got a problem. I'm looking at that team and I'm thinking, I don't know who it is. Mm. And see, see if it's someone like Pogba. You've got a problem because Pogba is all about Pogba. Pogba is not all about the team. He's a great player, a fantastic player when he does it. But you need someone who you can core build it around. When I'd ask both of you, who would you say it is? I, I can't tell who it is. Right, we were just talking there while Pat and Evan was explaining... Um What's going to happen Man United with Graham McInerney about you are a Man United fan? I am, yeah. <laughs> For my troubles. But, but uh, I don't know, there could be, could be look around the corner and see how the window, transfer window goes. Are you, were, you, were you one of those people who wanted Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to get the job after the Paris Saint-Germain game? We were talking earlier on, um, we played a clip of Rio Ferdinand who was like, give the man a blank contract and let him write down whatever number he wants, he's the right man for the job. <laughs> I suppose at the time he seemed like the right man for the job. He was saying and doing all the right things. He still is, I suppose. Um, but I suppose he probably just needs a new, new team, and yeah. and I suppose the players as well, and all that. So probably give him a transfer window or two to judge him. If um, you know, if if there were players in your dressing room who weren't pulling their weight the way some of the Man United players aren't pulling their weight at the minute, what would happen? Uh, I suppose I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's hard to know. I suppose that is you can hear a lot. Is that as good as they are, or, or is this, is there more in them? Like they are trying and they're working hard. Going on a few games, but maybe, maybe I suppose Roy Keane would say it a bit better than me, but a bit more rootless about it. But uh, yeah, I suppose you will get a few bo- a bit of bollock and I. Yeah, from each other. Yeah, oh, you would, yeah, yeah. And you'd percent. expect it. You would. And was that the culture when you came into the team? I suppose there's standards there. You kind of, you'd kind of want to meet, even being involved with the club, and all that earlier on in the year. You you try to set a standard, a high standard, 
to everyone to reach and I suppose if lads are bollocking each other for dropping a ball, it's only going to raise the standard to make that person better. might sound like a bad thing to do at the time, but you know, it's only going to improve them and, and me. And when you were first breaking into the squad, was that something you accepted? Or was that something you were like, hang on a second, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to make some <laughs> mistakes here. Uh, I suppose any time, I suppose there's no flawless training session or a flawless match either, but any time you do make mistakes, I'd be the first one to think about it. I'd be pissed off about it. I wouldn't want to. I tried the same thing again, mostly in training. Yeah. Hopefully, to perfect know, it. Keep, yeah, I keep yeah. trying it. If I fix something up, I try it again and keep trying it until I got it right, and then I move on from it. Yeah. Whether whatever it is, a sideline or whatever, I can't finish on a bad one. Yeah. Is that a consistent process? Is that something you're still working on? Where there are things in training where you're still trying to perfect? Ah, uh, there is, and there always will be. I'd say, like, you're never really a finished article. Like, you, you might. You might practice low balls there for two or three weeks and get unreal at it, and then wait a minute, <laughs> I need to start practicing high ones or or whatever. So it's it's trying to balance everything really. Yeah, just, uh, just want to tell everybody, girls in the studio this morning with thanks to Littlewoods Ireland, who are proud sponsors of the All Ireland Senior Hurling Championship. Their hashtag style of play campaign continues to bring together the world of sport and fashion, showcasing the style and skills of the players both on and off the pitch. Follow the hashtag style of play on the Littlewoods Ireland website or their social channels. Are you into your fashion? I am a bit. <laughs> I am. I, I like to dress up every now and again. Like uh, I wear a lot of track suits every now and again. But, yeah. You know, it's good to get the suit. It's out. good to get the jeans on or whatever it took or whatever black yeah. tie event or anything. It's, yeah. It's nice to dress up. So yeah, all stars. The all stars do matters, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there's a lot of lads trying to outdo each other, I'd say, in the dresses <laughs> as much as the women's, so it's competitive enough on that side too. How's the hurling going this year for you? What's uh, what's your own level of form like at the moment? Um, I suppose involved, being involved with the club early on in the year kind of gave me a bit of, a bit of time away from the setup, so I kind of feel feel fresh and I suppose uh, ready to go. So uh, form is form form is good. And how do you gauge that? How do you gauge your own form? Like what what when you know. When do you feel like you're going well? What do you have to do? Are there certain markers in your head that you go, okay, yeah, I'm, you know, my touch is good, my physical strength is good, my fitness is, my high-end sprinting is good. What, what are you looking for? Um, I suppose probably looking for perfection, which, which is never really possible. So you're always kind of looking, seeing what you need to improve on. And, and I suppose there's no better way of doing that than playing games. The more you play games, even, even with club or anything, there's plenty of things to take away from. And that's more probably the exciting thing about it. Like it gives you something to work on and something to focus towards for the next day, and then the weeks, the weeks just fly that way. How was the club month for you? Um, we, it was, it was good. It was good, yeah. Um, see, we were we were off the back of a high kind of. We we beat Charlevoix in an All Ireland final. So mm -hmm. so after that, we had there was a bit of a high there. Lads, uh, lads were eager to go again. Like they tasted a bit of a bit of victory. So it it was it was good. It was two matches. It was a three. Two matches we played, um, I suppose the lads are raring to go again, like they can't believe it's over already. They're, yeah. they're kind of in championship mode, but I suppose they'll relax down for a while and put their feet up and then get things going again for championship later on, yeah. And is it a case of like training once with the county during the week and a couple of times at the club, or how does it work? Um, yeah, there is, there's, there is demands from kind of, from both, but um, I suppose I suppose in the club week, the players do want to see you, see you down and just uh, give an encouragement, so I try to give as much time to to both uh, as possible. Yeah, it seems that it kind of makes sense having two separate things. That, like, just looking from the outside in, it seems that perhaps a club month in the middle of two competitions perhaps isn't the best way to do it. it it's hard to tell, but some counties clearly have it off to a tee when it comes to the month of April. Yeah, I suppose it is, it is tricky. Like, it's hard to know. Everyone kind of does give out about it and how it's kind of giving them a taste for it and then you're taking it away. But it's hard to know. Like, is there a structure there better than it? It's hard to know. Like, um, I know there's a lot of ideas kind of flying around there, but even seeing our lads like they were, they got the championship fever and then they were kind of, it was kind of taken away from them a bit, but I suppose that will see, can they keep hungry for the next few months? Like? Um, you obviously uh, are a centre-back. Were you always a centre-back? Now, is that something that you kind of have become as your career has gone on? or were you? Um, I'd say if, if I could look from underage when I started playing all the way up, I'd say... If, 90, 95% of my games was centre back, maybe a small bit midfield, but it was. Did you ever have any choice about that, or was that like a that we know where he's playing? <laughs> Go up and take the jersey. <laughs> Pull that six. Um, uh, I'd say it was a bit of both, probably. You know, it was a bit of. I liked playing there. I always kind of found a bit of a bit of freedom in the position, and I suppose the position 
kind of got used to knowing and growing up playing it, playing it. How has it changed since you started? Is um, you're 28 now, is that right? Yeah, 28. Yeah. Yeah. So you've obviously been playing. Um, I presume you were playing senior at 18 or 19, were you for the club? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you've 10 years of senior club hurling and whatever. Um, five seasons now with Galway senior. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. 14. Yeah. So how has the role changed? Um, it's just going attention to detail really more so than Anthem. That's kind of that's kind of changed a bit. Um, but it's still the same kind of commitment levels or whatnot. I know lads are kind of Sorry, I mean the centre back role. Like in, oh, the centre back yeah, role. Yeah, like uh, it, uh, has that position moved? Is your responsibility different now than it would have been? A lot of Roman 11s, I suppose. Now, what do you do? Do you pass them off or do you go with them or how does that? I suppose you probably have two choices. You can either pass them off and try all the position or you can you can follow follow out the field. It's kind of every game is kind of different and you kind of have to make that decision like but you you predominantly want to kind of keep that six area kind of full and plugged up a small bit, you know. So it's, it's a kind of zonal role that it, it is, it can be. It depends. You have to be able to adapt I suppose in, to, to different scenarios and different types of games. In the in the moment or pre-planned. So if you're coming up against a team, um, so if if I'm Tipperary or if I'm um, any of those other teams who have those centre forwards who I know can go in there and, and do a role and be uh, knacky around you yeah. and drag you out of position, I'm going to try and do that. And you know that too. Yeah. So pre-game, are you like, well, if if he comes in and plays ten minutes there, don't be suckered into getting tight and then going out the field and leaving hole for the other last to run in. Is that pre-game or are you going, well, I'm going to go with him because actually I think he's going to do more damage out there? It's a bit of both. Um, I suppose sometimes you kind of have to see it, see it and react. If I suppose if he's doing damage out the field, you'd want to go out and, and tag him or you need to get someone else to tag him for you. And maybe a lot of teams now, I suppose, are bringing another man out on top of, on top of you as well. So it doesn't feel like your man is kind of roaming a bit, but uh, I suppose every game is kind of different and you have to be able to adapt and teams are coming up with different different ways day in, day out of of um, challenging teams, so you just have to be able to adapt on the day is probably the best When do best you get way. comfortable making those adaptations? When do you feel like, okay, I know what you're doing now, so I've seen enough of this? I suppose it's important not to get too much bogged down on it and think about it too much and kind of just go with instinct and trust, trust you'll deal with it kind of a bit and prepare yourself to deal with it. Um, so on the day, you just just focus on your hurling and your work rate and all that come come together. I'd say like sometimes you can get bogged down too much on tactics and it affects your overall performance. As in you're thinking about it too much when actually yeah. you should just be doing the hurling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned at the start here about freedom and the position allowing you to have that bit of freedom when it comes to hurling. Is that the position that gives you the most freedom, or would you rather be playing somewhere else if you want to play off the cuff a little bit more? Um, Sometimes, sometimes you can get a bit of freedom. Sometimes you you don't like you might get on a lot of ball at times. You might just be plugging up channels and and for runs and all that and stepping in front and stopping stopping them from hitting kind of ball there. So you, sometimes you can be kind of blocking up that way. So you mightn't be getting on the ball as much. But I suppose in terms of it is a central role. So when you do get the ball, you have you have a lot of areas you can kind of go. So it's kind of good that way. How familiar are you with uh, your dad's career? Like, th is that something that you read about when you were a kid? Is that something you were kind of? Uh, I would have watched a few old VR videos or whatever. <laughs> um, growing up, I suppose. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, when you were younger, we would have been kind of in it a bit. And because um, uh, one of my favorite things, obviously the the white boots, which we can talk about in a minute, <laughs> but um, one of my favorite things is that like there would have been summers where the lads would have been in New York and then they'd come back for the championship because Galway obviously only entered the championship at the semi-final stage. Yeah. You could have the best of both worlds. You could go off and <laughs> travel the world and have the crack and then you could come back and you could play senior championship hurling and win all Ireland. It was like <laughs> this kind of perfect tiny window where... Um, or you could be Johnny Glynn. And do it now. Johnny yeah, you, now. you can still do it today. <laughs> yeah, Johnny, like, I know Dad did it back in the day, but he'd always, he'd be training hard over there. Like, they'd be, they wouldn't be... In, I suppose he enjoys the sun a lot. <laughs> you can tell any time there's a bit of sun out here, like, <laughs> he's straight out on it, like, try to get that time back. Um, he might even bring a white pair of runners with him, <laughs> run around the garden. <laughs> but, um, I know Johnny, you can, Johnny's a lad you can trust and you know he's doing work over there. You know, he's, he, you know, anytime he comes back, he's in top, top shape and no one can really challenge him on that. So, like, uh, you kind of just have to trust him in that way. I know the game is kind of, is evolving a lot and it, it seems, it seems a bit weird doing that but 
if you can trust a lad like Johnny to do it, like, why not? Like? Yeah. Do you have that travel bug? Is that something that you kind of feel like is part of your future? Um, I suppose I did a bit when I was younger. I was kind of went, went away. I was hurling in Boston for a while and uh, a few few lads' holidays, as, as you will. So I kind of did a small bit when I was younger, so I'm kind of happy enough and we just set up a new business there. So kind of... You're here for the future? For a while, anyway. <laughs> Are you... Is it fair to call you a bit of a late bloomer in terms of um, the intercounty hurling scene? Uh, yeah, I suppose it would. I suppose it would be. Yeah, um, yeah. I played a bit. I suppose I played a bit minor, and I didn't really. I didn't make. I didn't make the minor minor panel. So I kind of. I just stopped really my interest totally in it for a while, for a year or two, and then after a while, I suppose I got a bite for it again, playing club and all that, and I said I'll just go for this. We played a clip earlier on of um, Marie Crow talking about Shane O'Donnell, and obviously Shane O'Donnell bursts on the uh, national scene with a hat trick in an All Ireland final, and becomes instantaneously one of the most famous hurdlers in the country. But um, he had to go to Harvard, and when he went to Harvard, Marie was saying that uh, he met a couple of Irish lads there, and he was like, "Don't talk to me about hurling. I'm, I'm not here to be a hurdler. I'm here to be a yeah. researcher. I'm here to be the same as everybody else." And then a couple of months later, he's like. Wouldn't mind just watching some hurling or listening to some hurling on the radio. <laughs> so he kind of he had that bug. It was yeah. in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. When you were away from eighteen to nineteen, was there something gnawing at you that you felt like you needed to get back into the game? I suppose I would. I, I'd be fairly competitive. Like um, I'd be fairly competitive. So there was, I was playing a lot of sports at the time too, playing up to five. Like so, it was kind of take your pick. Then at that stage, and you played rugby. Played rugby in school. Yeah. Um, I played badminton in school. Right. And was there, were Connacht interested at any point? Was there ever any prospect um, of them? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, there, was, there, was, there was a lot of Connacht tries around at the time, but I wasn't overly... I got, it got a bit too serious for me then in the school, so I had to kind of step away because I was putting a lot of time into hurling and Gaelic at the time. Right. So Gaelic football was an option? Yeah, it was, yeah. Would have been pretty much in kind of the last five years I haven't really... Kicked the ball, I don't know where we're going off, I kicked it. Yeah, so what got you back into it? Why, why did you get stuck back into hurling? I suppose, um, I don't know, it's just, just a great sport. Like, it's a great feeling playing. It's, you know, you're, you're out there and you just have to win your own ball and it's a dog-eat-dog, dog. it's just... Was there any pressure involved in being your dad's son? No, he never really put any pressure on me. Um, like. If we want, if I want to go out for pucks, I go out. But he never force, he'd never force it on on me or or Sean. Um, but from the from the Galway hurling community, it would have been like, well, there's a chip off the old block. He's a big lad. He plays six. I mean, you know, yeah, the expectation, I guess, rather than pressure. Is that is yeah. that? Maybe uh, I suppose there could there could have been a small bit of it there, but I you wouldn't really put yourself under that. Yeah, I wouldn't really pay any heed to it. I was just happy playing my few sports and, yeah. and seeing where that would take me. And so then when you do eventually decide to kind of commit to hurling, the, the speed at which you nailed down the sixth position and became um, somebody that people talk about as one of the best centre-backs in the country, that was really quick. So like it's kind of late bloomer, you know, but from the time you're 24 to now, everybody's like, well, this guy's number six and um, well, maybe the last three seasons is more accurate. <laughs> He's like uh, nailed on number six and one of the best in the country. What was the what's the growth? How does that process happen? I suppose there's a lot of behind the scenes work and just trying to work hard and, and improve yourself as as you go, like and as much as you can. And I suppose, is that a change of mindset from your part then? I think I always had that mindset for right. for a long time. I think you'd need it for a while, like not not playing as many game times and being still being there. You kind of need that mindset, so that will be tested a lot. But. Um, I know you, to evolve, you need. You, I suppose it's great to be playing playing games, and you can't you can't beat that. Like yeah. And then the the evolution of this Galway team in, in recent years to go from a team that had had so long without an All Ireland win, um, and to be part of the team that eventually gets over the line. What difference does that make to the group's confidence? I suppose. We 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 always knew we were um, a good team if we worked worked hard enough, and we have I suppose there's a lot of talented hurlers in in Galway, so we just knew we had to bring a lot of work rate and, and commitment to it, and we were in with a chance. But all the previous teams in, in between had loads of great hurlers and did have work rate and commitment. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, there were a lot who were unlucky. In fairness, you know, it was a long a long time, and a few a few did come close and. I know it, it was it was great to do that, but um, 
yeah, it, it was it was a good feeling, and I suppose it was great for the supporters and all that. We want to give them a team that they can proudly support. Is it something that, when you're in the middle of your playing career, you actually do need to lean back on and go, hang on a second, now you know we we deserve to be considered all Ireland contenders, and we consider ourselves all Ireland contenders, and we know we can do it. Um, or is that something that you just park and say, at the end of my career, I look back on the fact that we won medals? Like, um, at some I'd level, fair, yeah, I'd first kind of look park it for now. Um, cause it was, and then just see see where it takes you, and just enjoy enjoy the journey. Like, because there is a lot of commitment coming in from from every team now. It's it's massive, and every team is is really going for it. Yeah. Does what happened last year drive you on a little bit more than what happened the previous year? Uh, I suppose you have to take you have to take drive in in what you can. Like, and I haven't really dwelled on it too much. I've been focusing more on my myself and my own performances and trying to get that right. But um, yeah, kind of you'd have, you know, you, like you do, you want to you want to do better and try better yourself. Was there much talk about that in in the weeks and months after that? Because it was uh, kind of an unusual performance from Galway that day, where Limerick were the better team, but you came so close in the end to forcing a replay that there must have been a huge element of regret there, but a huge element of we could still arguably be one of the best teams in the country. Um, I suppose yeah, we were kind of nearly straight back into into club action after that, you know, which was probably a good, a good way, a good distraction, like of 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 for that, like. But um, yeah, it's it's kind of a funny one. I haven't really dwelled on it too much. I suppose I didn't really get time just because we just we just kind of kept kept going with club for for some reason. So I didn't really look too much on it. It kind of feels like the season's kind of come together now. Yeah, it was a bit of a mad year for Galway in that um, you played well without ever actually hitting your peak last year. It, it felt like you were 85% of what you had been at your best the previous year and that actually this team still has loads more in it. Yeah, I suppose it's yeah, it's just one of them where I suppose we didn't didn't really rightly get going. Um, and yet reached an All-Ireland final. Yeah. Uh, I felt we were we were good in the le- the build up games like it's just I suppose it's just on the day it can happen you, you can be just a bit flat for some reason it does happen like uh, you have to prepare yourself the best for it but times it can happen yeah but that must give you a bit of confidence heading into this year that actually you know if we make a few little changes here and there you know and if if we do find our true level that we're going to be hard beaten yeah um, yeah you I suppose you, you want to really focus on and I suppose the next game is the best thing you can really do and try and get a performance there and like it does build, it builds from the first game and you kind of need to stay stay building and your confidence will go with that. So the next game is Carlo and we're all kind of looking looking forward to that and where that will take us. Well listen, best of luck with that and best of luck with the new business as well. Do you want to give it a plug while you're here? Uh, ben, he was Galway there. <laughs> Two lads are working for today, thanks. There you go. Uh, Garrod's in studio today with thanks to Litwoods Ireland who are proud sponsors of the All-Ireland Senior Hurling Championship. Follow their hashtag style of play campaign on the Littlewoods Ireland website or their social channels. Here's another short clip from our sit-down with nine-time Irish flat champion jockey Pat Smullen about fighting pancreatic cancer. It's all in association with giveblood.ie. Again, that full chat is on YouTube and offtheball.com. I, I actually never thought I was going to die. I, I, I just didn't allow myself and whether that was a foolish thing or, you know, I ne- and to this day, I don't, you know, I, I was co- of course it's going to happen to us all at some yeah. stage, but uh, but right now I'm not ready and uh, and I never allowed myself to think that. But of course, on, on occasion you get down and you, you, you know, but I, I, I'll be honest with you, it'll be for about half an hour, an hour, and then I give myself a kick up the backside and just say, come on, get on with it. And, and then when you see your kids and, mm. and a great wife and, and I have a lot to live for and, you know, Maybe uh, you know it's how, how I dealt with it anyway, and uh, and I think that stood me in good stead because mm. uh, I just didn't allow negative negativity into and I, I, and there's some people that are very well meaning, but there was some people that just you know I, I didn't like meeting in that they were how oh, you know how are things and the, their expression of well they meant good. That their whole demeanor was and their expression was that oh this is you know it's terrible You're on the way out yeah this yeah is that's exactly yeah, yeah. so uh, you know I actually tried to distance myself from a few people like that and uh, I just wanted all positivity around me and uh, and I think that was very very important I think it's very very important and if if there's one bit of advice I'd give to anybody that's going through the same thing is to to just keep positive because. Mm. 
you know, there's so much happening on a daily basis as regards, you know, uh, testing and, uh, you know, research and there's everything's happening. And so I, I kept telling myself, you know, this, this, they'll come up with something and yeah. that this treatment will work. And, mm. you know, so I, I, that was very important to me. And uh, to be honest with you, that's how I dealt with it. Right. Yeah, Pat Mullen, pretty amazing man. You can get that whole interview with Joe. It aired last night on the radio and Off the Ball on Newstalk, and you can get the whole thing on uh, offtheball.com. Now, the final question for our Heineken Green Ticket competition this morning here on OTVAM. We are sending somebody to Ireland against Scotland in Yokohama City on the 22nd of September in Japan for the Rugby World Cup. It's a brilliant prize and it's all thanks to Heineken. This morning you can win our very last pair of green tickets on OTB AM because next week on the 9th of May, uh, all 100 of our green ticket winners will join us and at the end of the night, one lucky winner will be heading to Japan. Across the show, we've asked you two questions already. When you have all three answers, send them in to us. Get ready to send us your answers. We asked you question one at 8.15, question two at 8.45, question three at 9.36 this morning. Who won the 2003 Rugby World Cup with a drop goal? Who was it? Who won the 2003 Rugby World Cup? You need to have all three questions and you can enter right now if you have uh, all three answers. We'll um, announce the winners a little bit later on on social media. We'll give you an opportunity to um, go back and get those three answers if you missed them. On Off The Ball tonight... Claire's Peter Duggan, Arsenal's Louise Quinn, Kenny Cunningham is in the studio for the night's Champions League action. It's uh, Spurs against Ajax. Who's going to win? We called this yesterday, didn't we? Gary Breen said there's no way he can see Ajax winning. But I think Ajax are going to do the business over two legs. Do you? I don't. How? Fatigue. Well, okay. Fatigue. And the absence of, absence of your top players. I mean, it is going to be probably Fernando Llorente starting up, like, you know, Champions League semi-final, Fernando Llorente. But come at the hour, what? It's going to be like a really novel uh, finalist, regardless of what it is. And the chances are that finalist will lose. Uh, the, the winner of the Champions League is probably in tomorrow night's tie. Which may seem harsh on Spurs, given if they get all their best talent back for you give Spurs in time a good chance against Liverpool, wouldn't you? You give Spurs a better chance in the Champions League final, but given the circumstances at the moment, yeah, I don't know why. I just ha- I just have a strong feeling for Ajax in this. But they were so rubbish that night we saw them. That was a long time ago. It was. Like, so much um, happened in, since November. October. And all those players have like put in five months in their professional career since then, which is a fairly significant chunk of time. With hours and hours of top quality football. Yeah, especially at the age that they're all at. So I it's just it's not not by any means do I strongly go up against the Spurs in this one. I just I just have a, a feeling based on what we've seen at the weekend uh, against West Ham, and not because of the, the quality. I think I actually think that they ran more than West Ham at the weekend, weirdly. So maybe the jaded thing is a little bit overplayed. Uh, but like, how uh, are you really getting up for West Ham in a home game before the Champions League semi final? No, you're, you're not. Are not. You're not. You're like I'm just not going to get injured here. That there may there may have been a, a strong dose of that, and like this is without question the most important game of their season so far. So there there is a huge dose of saving themselves for it, but just have a strong feeling about Ajax. There, like what is saving yourself more than Spurs playing a bit off it against West Ham? It is going to the league and saying, hey, can we have the weekend off and getting that successfully? So Ajax are also well up for this. Um, if you have watched the latest episode of Game of Thrones, then you should head straight over to youtube.com forward slash off the ball and you can watch the very latest uh, Game of Thrones show it's called Off the Wall it's our podcast it's with Andy Lee and it's available right now wherever you get your podcasts and um, it has millions and millions and millions of spoilers because it is a reaction show so make sure you've seen the show first uh, that Pat Small interview it's an hour long special go check it out on our YouTube channel or on offtheball.com um, the winner of our Skoda We Love Cycling Dalai competition we asked you to send us your favourite cycling route in Ireland um, Peter Golden sent us this my favourite is the Waterford Greenway the Waterford Greenway I haven't been on it but apparently people rave about it they say it's absolutely stunning and it has been a massive surge in tourism for the entire sunny southeast. so uh, we might get a chance to check that out a little bit later on this summer so uh, good man yourself courtesy of wheelofcycling.ie which includes helpful tips for all the cyclists from buying bikes nutrition advice and info on the best cycle routes in Ireland uh, Peter Golden good man yourself you pick up today's pack which is um, including a Skoda cycling jersey, shorts, a hoodie, t-shirt cap and water bottle for your bike. Uh, Now, that is it from us for today's show. At 9.40, a specially extended show for you this morning. We'll give you an opportunity. You can keep entering our um, hiding competition on social. Just use hashtag OTBAM and answer our three questions. We will see you tomorrow, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, with a preview of Liverpool against Barcelona in the Champions League and reaction and analysis to what happens tonight. 
in the game at White Hart Lane. Good luck.